My friend, Mark and I, love exploring abandonments. We've been doing it for years, and I'm telling you, it never gets old. The constant creepy feeling, finding new areas, guessing at the history, it's almost addicting. From the first time we did it, we were hooked. Still, you can only explore houses for so long before you have to move on to something bigger. And that's what led us to what happened last year. There was this huge, abandoned hospital near us, just a few towns over. We'd never seen it ourselves, but knew it had been abandoned for several decades, having closed down in favour of a smaller, more modern one. Mark shot me down the first few times I suggested it, since he was worried about getting caught by the police. Eventually, I was able to convince him though, pointing out that they'd probably just tell us to leave. It was around 7.30pm when we left, but it was summer so the sun was still up. On the way there, we went over the plan one more time. The hospital was pretty isolated, and the area around it was overgrown. The idea was to drive to a parking lot about a quarter mile away. From there, we'd sneak through the bushes, and by the time we got there, it would be dark enough to walk across that last paved stretch to the front doors unseen. When we got to the parking lot, we stood by the car for a few minutes. The road next to the lot went by the hospital, and we wanted to get an idea for the traffic, and therefore our chances of being seen. It seemed like our odds were pretty good. In the ten minutes we waited, only a single car went by. Next, we checked our supplies. For each of us, a flashlight, a water bottle, some disinfectant, a box of band-aids, and a cheap radio, for when we inevitably decided it would be creepier if we split up. As I started for the trees, Mark tapped me on the shoulder. I almost forgot, I got this from the library earlier. He reached into his backpack and retrieved a rolled up piece of paper. It's a map of the building, for the fire exits and stuff, you take it. I asked, doesn't a map kind of defeat the purpose of exploring? We'll only look at it if we have to. If one of us gets hurt, it would kind of suck to bleed to death looking for the exit. Alright, but why do I have to take it? Because one of us means me. He had a point. In the years we'd been exploring, we'd had three total injuries. All of them were him. I put the map in my back pocket and we started towards the hospital. Just as planned, it was dark when we got there. Because of the surrounding trees, we couldn't make out a clear silhouette of the building against the sky. Shining our flashlights on it showed a brick exterior and three floors. Most of the windows were broken. The main entrance was wide open. One of the double doors was on the ground nearby, with the other nowhere to be found. Most definitely, we were not the first people to check it out, which was expected. I don't think we've ever had to break in ourselves. In we went. The place was in really bad shape. The floor was covered in dirt, and most of the doors had been kicked in. There were holes in most of the walls, indicating that thieves had taken the copper wiring. There was also loads of water damage. With all of this, do I even have to mention the graffiti? The first floor was probably the most interesting. It had the cafeteria, staff room, and by far most interestingly, the morgue. There was even a set of tools left behind. As a rule, we don't take things from abandonments, but at that time, we really wanted to. We went up the stairs to the second floor. There, 
Most of the doors were intact, and there was no graffiti. I guess the teenagers looking for trouble were too lazy to climb a set of stairs. The thieves had motivation though, and there were just as many holes in the wall as downstairs. It was at this time that, as always, Mark wanted to split up. I tend to take my time, and he moves pretty quickly in comparison. I go for details, he aims to see everything. Because of this, I knew he'd end up far away from me. It was alright with me though, as I kind of liked the silence. The creepiness is a big part of what makes it fun, and if he didn't split us up, I probably would have. The second floor was mostly just patient rooms. Beds and tables, nothing much. As I was exploring, I could hear Mark's footsteps upstairs. They'd go a distance, stop, I'd hear the faint sound of a door opening, and then I'd hear him move away. He really had gotten ahead. I'd only explored about half of the floor, because I then came across a relatively large sitting room, which was in the middle of the building. It was actually pretty well illuminated by moonlight, thanks to the large window that made up one wall. Looking out, I could see the paved front area we had entered from. I didn't really need the flashlight, so I turned it off. There was a coffee table in the centre of the room, surrounded by four old sofas. I sat down at one of them for a water break. It was pretty creepy, just sitting there alone, everything bathed in a dull blue light. I kept seeing things out of the corner of my eye, but in that light, this was expected. I was just putting my bottle away when I heard my radio crackle. Mark said, Hey, I'm kind of lost here. Can you help me find you? I would have been annoyed at having to use the map, but after seeing things for a few minutes, I was kind of creeped out and wanted to get back together. Alright, what's the nearest room number? I asked. I'm in room 308. Okay, you're in the east wing, third floor. Where do I go from here? Walk so that the numbers are descending. There should be a staircase next to 301. About two minutes went by. I was about to try talking to him again when he came back on. Okay, these stairs are blocked. Where are you? I answered. I'm in a sitting area in the middle of the second floor. I take it you're next to 301 now? Yes. Okay, now you want to move in the ascending order again. There should be an employee staircase next to 349. That leads down here. Across the hall from the sitting room, according to the map, was a staff lounge. This is where the stairs went. After 10 more minutes, I could hear Mark's footsteps above me. Once again, the radio crackled on. These stairs, right here? Yep, I can hear you above me. As I listened to him walk off, I went to the door of the staff lounge. On the other side, I could hear Mark descending the steps and walking across the room. When he reached the door, the knob jiggled, but it was locked. I yelled through the door to unlock it. Strangely, he answered through the radio, even though he was just on the other side. The lock is broken, you'll have to open it for me. I really don't like damaging sites, but I was way too freaked out to keep sitting there by myself while I led him to another staircase. I backed up and got ready to kick the door down. Just as I was about to kick it, my cell phone rang. I practically jumped through the ceiling. I answered the phone. What? Christ, you scared the crap out of me. And you've been scaring the crap out of me. 
was Mark. I asked, what do you mean I've been scaring you? You weren't answering my radio. I've been outside for like 20 minutes. Where are you? I went back to the sitting room and looked out the window. Sure enough, there he was on the pavement. I asked, okay, I'm on the second floor, the big window in the middle. I saw him looking around for a second. He said, yeah, yeah, I see you. It was then that I heard a loud series of bangs. I ran into the hall. The staff room door was shaking with each hit. Whoever was on the other side was wailing on it, trying to get out. I turned around and tore out of there. I met up with Mark outside, and without a word, we ran through the woods to the parking lot. We got in the car and sped off towards his house. When we got there, I told him what had happened. Then he gave me his experience. When I went ahead of you to the other end of the second floor, I tried to get upstairs but it was blocked by debris, but I heard footsteps up there. I kept trying to get to you on the radio and ask how you did it, but you weren't answering. I thought you were screwing with me, but I was creeped out. I waited for you outside and eventually thought to try your phone. I was thoroughly freaked out, but he still had one last detail for me. There's one more thing, he said. Remember when I called you? And you asked if I could see you? I did see you, but... He paused. I didn't want to say anything then. But I could swear I could see people in the third floor windows. Let me get this out of the way. This is not a cursed internet chain letter. You will not be asked to forward this story. Reading it or hearing it will not kill or curse you. This is a story about my childhood. A memory. One that just resurfaced, kicking and screaming to the forefront of my mind. I would managed to forget about it, but the past always has a way of coming back around. Forgetting didn't make it go away. I was a kid when the internet was new and cell phones were an expensive novelty. I didn't have as many distractions as modern children, but it wasn't for lack of trying. Rather than pay attention in class, I'd create my own distractions. It didn't take much. I was a daydreamer with a well-travelled imagination. As I got older, I became more interested in making new friends. Real friends, which were easily gained when I invented a game for the entire class to play. It wasn't exactly imaginative, but it was fun. The game? Passing a single note around without getting caught. Simple, right? The game didn't have a name. We figured if we didn't name it, it would be a lot harder to get caught. We didn't even use the word game. We referred to it as taking notes, just in case anyone overheard. A lot of the fun came from the secrecy and the ninja moves we had to master in order to pass the note around unnoticed. There were three rules. Don't get caught. Add something. Pass it on. We won when the note was passed around and came back to me. At recess, we'd read the note and have a good laugh. Sometimes we'd collectively make up one big story or each share a joke. It all depended on what I wrote first. It was only a little bit of power, 
but it still went straight to my head. Suddenly, I was the most popular kid in class. I didn't need the daydreams, not like I used to. We almost always won. I'm not sure if we really were master sneaks or if Mrs. Knott didn't care. In order to be stealthy enough to play, we were well behaved and didn't interrupt class. It was a harmless game. Part of our camouflage required us to actually take notes for class. It was funny. I didn't realize the game inadvertently defeated the purpose. Kids really aren't as clever as they think they are. At least, I wasn't. I remember when everything changed. The game started off like it always did. Every time the teacher turned to write something on the whiteboard, the note changed hands. I could hear the scratching of pencils and pens and paper with the quiet monotony of the lesson. My thoughts were set to drift. I thought about how things had been different just the year before. Real friendship was a lot less frightening than the warped version my head had made up. I didn't miss any of my imaginary friends. They were all but erased as I started learning the social skills I'd lacked when I was younger. I was roused from my reverie when Lydia jumped out of her seat, stumbling backwards and falling on her butt. Most of the class laughed at her expense, all of us immature enough to find it funny. No one disliked Lydia. She was a little chubby but very sweet. But seeing anyone fall like that was bound to get a laugh. Every eye in the room watched the girl fumble and fret. Lydia was red-faced and sweaty as she quickly collected her papers off the floor and sat back down at a desk without a word. Her round cheeks quivered as she tried to compose herself, but the damage was already done. I thought I saw a spider, a big one, Lydia explained. I'm sorry for interrupting Mrs. Nutt. Lydia hung her head, wringing her braids. Mrs. Nott nodded and turned back to the whiteboard without comment, either accepting her explanation as true or choosing not to question it. I turned my attention back to my note-taking, and before long, the note made its way back. I didn't look right away. I liked to be surprised at recess. The bell rang, and I cheerfully shuffled out the door for lunch. The class seemed quieter than usual as we filed out and headed for the cafeteria. Lydia stopped me in the hallway. Her face was still red, and her eyes glossy with unshed tears. Lydia usually kept to herself. She participated in taking notes, but was shy and usually didn't socialize unless she had to. What's the matter? I asked, perplexed. We were alone in the hall. Staff and students alike didn't waste time going to lunch, especially on pizza day. I felt a flutter of annoyance, but given the look on Lydia's face, I pushed it back. Don't show the note at recess. Her hands gripped her twin braids. Please? Why? I asked, reaching for the note so I could see what the problem was. Half the class already saw it since you passed it on. I wish I hadn't. She was pulling on her braids. I was worried she might pull them right off her head. Taking notes isn't fun anymore. Not if it's going to be like this. Like what? My first thought was that someone drew boobs or wrote swears. Either of those options would have been scandalous to our fourth grade sensibilities. Lydia looked at the note I was unfolding, chewing on her bottom lip so hard it started to swell. In an instant, I understood the problem. It was Lydia. 
a drawing of her. So well drawn, there could be no mistake. It was almost like looking at a black and white photograph. If not for the horizontal blue lines faintly visible beneath the expert pencil strokes. The drawing was not at a fourth grade level. But that wasn't what was alarming about it. In the picture, there was a horizontal cut across her stomach. Her hand held the wound open, bloody fingers digging in to pry the apparently self-inflicted wound wider. Her other hand unraveled intestines, pulling them to gore-smeared lips as though she were about to slurp them up like noodles. Her chubby arms were bloody up to the elbow. Even in black and white, I could tell what I was looking at. The rivulets were dark and glossy, even forming a reflective pool to display the gore from a different angle. Never in my life had I seen something like this. I wanted to throw up just looking at it. I couldn't imagine how Lydia must have felt. Once the full impact of the drawing hit me, I came back to my senses and crumbled the paper into a tight ball. I won't show anyone. Lydia nodded, shuffling from foot to foot in an awkward dance of nerves. The girl opened her mouth to say something else, then thought better of it, scurrying down the hall. I'd lost my appetite. No doubt Lydia did too. The air was thick with unasked questions. Who had drawn that? When I'd started the note, that drawing hadn't been there. I really didn't think anyone in the class would have or could have drawn it. There was no obvious explanation, but I didn't want to think about it. For some reason, it felt wrong to even wonder. At recess, Half the kids protested when I said I'd lost the note. The other half was conspicuously quiet. No one mentioned the drawing. There seemed to be an unspoken rule. We couldn't talk about it. We didn't want to. It was unanimous. The next day, Lydia wasn't in class. At first, I wasn't going to play the game but some of the kids kept looking at me expectantly. Only about half the class knew what happened. The other half expected we'd be taking notes as usual. For some reason, pretending it didn't happen seemed like the most sensible option. The game continued. I tore out a fresh sheet of notebook paper and stared down at it blankly, unsure of how to start this one. Any sense of mischief or fun was long gone for me. I didn't want to play anymore. Why did it feel like I had to? I scribbled something down. I don't even remember what. The game begun, but I didn't really pay attention until the dreaded note made its way back. I felt like a prisoner to the game. It was only a piece of paper, but it felt heavy to me. I didn't know what I'd see. I couldn't convince myself the game hadn't changed in some fundamental way. I wasn't the only one who felt that way. Just days before, we were all laughing and smiling. Not anymore. Only about half the class waited eagerly for me at recess. The other half trickling in heavy-footed with reluctance. It was as if they were here out of obligation. As I smoothed out the crease note, I almost wasn't surprised to see the new drawing. This time, it was Brian, a grisly scene sketched out with such realistic detail that my brain refused to register what I was looking at at first. Bubbling, blistered and blackened skin might have left him indistinguishable if not for the fact that his face was left untouched 
by the licking, angry flames, drawn out in color this time. Red, orange, yellow, and black. Brian's dimpled smile and freckled nose were unmistakable. His body positioned in a crouch beside a wall of flames, as though he were merely warming himself by a campfire, arms extended, hands rubbing together, charred skin flaking off with friction, peppering the fire with bits of blackened flesh. I pressed my hand over the drawing, covering it up, but it was too late. We'd already seen it. Even the drawing felt hot beneath my palm, words and bile competing in my throat as my eyes skimmed the rest of the note. Everything else was harmless. Snippets of conversation and jokes, benign doodles. I recognized the handwriting, knew who wrote or doodled what. Everyone was accounted for, except for Lydia. The only addition I couldn't explain was that drawing. It shouldn't have been there. It was as though some malevolent presence had decided to include itself in our game, uninvited. No one spoke of it, but it was clear from the shock and tears we'd all seen it this time. When I pulled my hand away from the drawing, it came away stained, red and black. I buried the note, along with the one depicting Lydia by the sledding hill, a cluster of silent children. It felt like a funeral. Brian was the last to leave the mound. His skin was the colour of sour milk, which made his freckles seem dark in stark contrast. He didn't cry. He didn't ask questions. He just stared at the dirt with glassy eyes, even after the bell rang and everyone else went to class. When I began to trudge back to class reluctantly, I swear I heard a whisper. Pass it on. Brian and Lydia were both absent the next day. Their two empty desks an ominous reminder. No one wanted to play, and all of us felt strangely compelled to participate. I ripped a new page from my notebook, not caring when the paper ripped like jagged teeth along the side. I started the game with a plea. I don't want to play anymore. The scrawled message almost illegible, as if even this violated some implicit rule. My hand kept moving across the page before I even realized what I was doing. Before I realized I wasn't in control of my arm anymore, I'd written a reply. Pass it on. Written in perfect cursive. Handwriting that wasn't my own. I'd lost feeling in my hand, looking down at it. It felt somehow separate from me, detached, as though I were looking at someone else's hand. My hand. The hand. Passed the note to William next. And so the game repeated. With each game, a new deadly prediction was pictured. Although we didn't know what happened to the students chosen by the note, we did know that they never came back to class. Tammy's demise was drawn, a snarling pack of dogs tearing at her legs and snapping her bones between sharp, bloody teeth. The girl smiled in the picture, petting one of the dogs as though it weren't tearing the flesh from her forearm. Calvin's portrait painted his body at the bottom of nightmare stairs, his body contorted, bent and broken, in every unnatural direction. His arms and legs resembled the very stairs he must have fallen from. No one wanted to play anymore. We were the ones being played. When I resisted, 
my arm would move on its own. I wasn't the only one. We stopped looking at the drawings, but it didn't matter. Someone would still be missing the next day. Then, we were caught. That day, there were seven empty desks. Lucy was about to finish the eighth deadly game when Mrs. Knott swiveled around from the whiteboard and caught her slim wrist. Without hesitation, the teacher took the note out of her hand and began lecturing us about disrupting our learning environment. The lecture was worth it. By getting caught, Lucy had lost the game. Losing the game had freed us somehow, breaking whatever hold it had over us. We never played the game again. Seven students never returned to school. As children, we were spared any sort of explanation, and no one asked. I spent the rest of that year, and every year after that, as a serious student. I went back to being a loner with no friends or games of any kind. I didn't even go to recess, opting to work on homework or read books in the quiet solitude of the library instead. I didn't think about what happened for a long time. I moved on with my life. Until last night. I was drinking by myself at the bar into the early hours, hoping that liquor would lubricate my sleepless night. An old woman claimed a stool beside me, her body stooped with age. That didn't stop her from swallowing several shots in quick succession. I didn't pay her much mind, staring vacantly at the assortment of hard liquors as a drunken haze began to sweep over me like a warm blanket. I could feel the woman's intense stare as she slid a piece of paper towards me. A soft rustle I somehow heard, even over the loud music. I stared down at the note on the counter. Dirty notebook paper, folded into a square with frayed edges. I looked up at the woman. Her mouth was moving soundlessly but I could tell she was saying the same thing over and over again. Pass it on. I recognized the woman. It was Mrs. Knott. There was no doubt about it. She hadn't aged well. Her eyes dark and haunted touched with madness. Her features were haggard and pale, her body frail, as though she were made of paper mache. I didn't need to open the note to know what it was. For all these years, the game had gone unfinished, until Mrs. Knott finally passed it on, back to me. The game was won. I can't begin to guess what happened to my old teacher, but it was enough to drive her to seek me out and deliver this note. I had to take it. Although my right hand felt like it was filled with pins and needles, it was my choice to reach out and take it. The game had been my idea. The lives lost were my burden to bear. The curse could only end with me. Thank you. I'll take it from here. You protected us. I'm so sorry. It was clear my old teacher had been fighting this curse for so long. Long enough that I had time to forget. Forgetting didn't make it go away. I'm sorry too, she weakly whispered, terror and regret competing on her face. We both sat and drank for a while, 
before I sent her home in a cab and headed home to face my fate. I haven't slept since. The note is on my desk, unopened. It doesn't matter. Even if I don't look, the game is over. I don't even need to wonder who this game will claim next. Although I live alone, I haven't been alone since the note found its way back. From the corner of my eye, a dark, ungraspable shape asks, Did you miss me? I wrote my story, knowing no one will believe it, but there isn't time to do anything else. Fortunately, there's nothing to leave behind. No family, no friends, not even a pet. Maybe I knew this would happen all along, somewhere deep down. I didn't want anyone to miss me. Meeting this monster, I realized something I'd secretly suspected all along. Whatever this creature is, I know it. I'd called it my friend once back in those daydreaming days, this nameless, shapeless thing. My imagination had taken credit for it, an innocent assumption. I turned my back on a lonely darkness, but it wouldn't let me go. It's a grave understatement to say that, as a kid, I was addicted to League of Legends. I came home from school every day just to play for hours until I fell asleep, never giving a damn about anything other than my league rank, which I thought would be dropping every second I wasn't online. If I was deprived of the game for a few days, I turned schizophrenic, like a crack addict in withdrawal. I was no faker, but I'm pretty certain I played more hours than him per day, and it's no exaggeration to say that my obsession was almost fatal. I could play for over 20 hours without food, water, or sleep. Things have gotten better since then. You might be glad to know that I deleted the game two years ago, and haven't touched it ever since. In fact, I avoid people when they talk about it. If someone asks me about the game, I pretend I don't know what it is. I threw away all the League merch I bought and deleted all the strategy manuals I downloaded. I stay miles away from anything to do with the game these days. The reason I never want to be reminded of anything to do with this game again stems from a long ordeal I endured when I was 16. I was home alone one evening, playing a game of League as usual. To see how it works, you can go and play the game yourself. It's one of the most popular PC games in the world, though I would strongly advise against it if you want a life. For the purpose of conserving your time, I'll only explain the necessary background knowledge to understand the story. For those that aren't familiar, League of Legends is a MOBA game, which relies on skill, strategy and teamwork. Each player is called a summoner, who controls an in-game champion with unique powers and abilities. Games are around half an hour long each, and you can pick a different champion each game. There are three lanes on the map, called the Summoner's Rift, and there are defensive turrets placed along each lane. There are two opposing teams with five summoners on each team, usually randomly matched, and the objective of the game is to bring down the enemy turrets in order to destroy their base and claim victory. If your champion is attacked, its health is lost. Your champion can die by losing all its health, and that means you have to wait a certain amount of time before respawning. 
You can attack enemy champions and kill them so they can't defend the turrets, which gives you gold to buy items and make your champion stronger. You usually get gold from killing enemy minions, which are small bots that help their team attack turrets. You can choose from a variety of champions to play each time you start a game. Some are more difficult to play than others, and each requires time to master properly. I was accustomed to playing champions known as ADCs, Attack Damage Carries, or Marksmen, long range. Consistent damage dealers, usually starting with lower maximum health. Because ADCs are especially vulnerable in early game with their low sustainability, it is usual to see them playing alongside a support champion, one with low damage but useful abilities which can enhance the ADC's attacks, heals the champions around them, shield allied champions from enemy attacks, stun enemy champions so that the ADC can do more damage, and other helpful effects depending on the champion. In late game, an ADC champion can carry the team to victory, able to annihilate entire enemy teams in mere seconds. Due to the lack of damage potential, people often find support champions boring to play. They are often blamed by ADCs and the rest of the team. Stop taking my farm, why don't you heal me, kill stealer? However, a skilled support player was sought after by every ADC player, and I was no exception. I would always friend request good support players after games, and as a reliable ADC myself, they would usually accept. That evening, I just finished a victorious game, which was completely turned around after an awful first half, in which a defeat seemed certain. I had never been more frustrated in my life. Our team was full of noobs, and I had been AFK for about half an hour after disconnecting and when I returned, I had terrible ping, so all I could really do was try not to feed. When I checked the end results, I was surprised to see a support with 18 kills and 1 death, while everyone else went about 2 kills to 5 deaths like me. To my surprise, this support player friend requested me before I exited the game, and I hurriedly accepted. The username was just a string of seemingly random numbers. This is how our chat history went. 4782998374920 Hi. Me. Hey, GG. Bad game. Why did you play like that? I'm usually a pretty civil guy. I play to have fun, not to cause drama. Usually, if players were toxic. I wouldn't hesitate to unfriend and block. Although at this point, I sensed a little toxicity, I thought it was just bants. We didn't even know each other yet, and it was true, my performance in the last game was pretty bad. Ah, oh, I was AFK, got bad ping. You look okay from match history. Players can check the results of other players' previous games results on their profiles. I'm good, usually. ADC main? Yeah, I play Lucian, Zaya, Ezreal, mostly. You're a really good support, though. What is your name? Josh, what's yours? Sophia. You're a girl? Yeah, what's wrong with that? There were probably more guys pretending to be girls than there were real girls that played League. Perhaps it's the toxic in-game chats, or the over-sexualization of some female champion designs. But I feel it's estimated only 10% of League's player base is female, though there may be more out there. Nothing, just asking. You think I must be bad because I'm a girl? No, I never said that, it's just I haven't seen many girls on here. Ugh, why are they always like this? Well, sorry, meant no offense. Perhaps it was a mistake to ask, but all I could think at the time was, God damn, she's sensitive. I closed the chat box, prepared to never talk to this girl again. 
when I received an invite from her. Despite our first conversation making me feel pretty uncomfortable, I knew she was a good support player, so if she respected me enough to invite, then what harm could it do? After checking my ping was decent, I entered her game. With our combined skill, we scored an easy victory, with the enemy team surrendering in less than 15 minutes. From there began an era of gaming success, consecutive wins that were rarely broken. As long as my connection was good and I kept focus, we were an unstoppable duo, plundering down all our adversaries like shoveling sand. She seemed to be online all the time, even more than me, which I found strange but convenient. I would never play without her, and as long as we weren't matched up with awful teammates, we would win. I never had such a competent partner in crime before in the game, so I wasn't too bothered about anything she said to me, as long as she agreed to keep playing with me. However, it would be a lie to say I wasn't peeved by a constant tutoring. For some reason, she felt the need to constantly remind me that I was the limiting factor in our duo. After each game, you can download and watch a replay of your game to analyze what you or any other player did throughout the game. It's an incredibly useful learning tool. However, it gets annoying if abused. I gave her my WhatsApp number, as it was easier to message outside the game. At first, the game was all we talked about, and she didn't seem eager to get to know me at all, so I dropped the efforts. After winning games, she would send me replay clips of when I missed skill shots, or should have done something differently. It would always come with an unnecessarily sarcastic remark. As much as I hated it, she was usually right, and accepting criticism is a key part of improving your gameplay. She did help me improve my technique, which was reflected in my performance. Perhaps that was just her personality, and I should be more thankful she's willing to take the time, I thought back then. After a while, we began to chat more. I found out she was 15 and from France. She was also homeschooled because she got bullied as a kid, which was probably why she had so much free time, nearly all of which she spent playing League of Legends. She liked listening to heavy metal and screamo. Above all, she made it clear to me she wasn't normal, and sent me her various psychologist reports in French claiming she had bipolar disorder and anger issues. Sure, I could tell she had problems, but she wasn't as bad as some people I had seen before with those issues. She was funny and nice sometimes, when she was in a good mood. I thought I could help her with her issues if I talked to her more often. She sent me a picture of herself cosplaying a support champion, Sona. If the girl in the photo was her, then she looked stunning. She had long wavy hair, which she dyed blue, and gorgeous blue eyes that seemed to glow. I considered the obvious possibility. I was being catfished. But to be honest, I didn't care what she looked like that much, as long as she was helping me secure those victories. Still, it felt good to think that there could be a babe behind that computer screen. Perhaps one day, we could even meet. When we lost games, which was rare at first, she would get extremely mad. Her reactions were so exaggerated that at first, even for someone with anger issues, I thought she had to be joking just to be funny or get a point across. She would curse at the other team members, search up and analyze their match history and watch replays of their mistakes over and over, texting me things like, what the hell was this retarded noob doing? various points of the replay. These were usually randomly matched ally summoners we would never see again. It was rare to see anyone more obsessed with the game than I was. 
and I slowly began to discover that her infatuation with it was on a new level. As you win more in League, games get harder. You get matched up with more experienced opponents, and soon it's difficult to keep your win streak up. The time eventually came when all this winning hit a plateau, and we were both getting frustrated. She would sometimes take her anger out on me, which I endured out of fear that she thought I was inadequate. We were both addicted as hell, completely dependent on each other and constantly lacking sleep. It spiralled into a pretty toxic situation after a few weeks. However, things really took a turn one evening. We were in a game in which one member of the enemy team scored a pentakill. I figured he must have been a smurfing pro player as nobody on our team was exceptionally bad. But it was just that he had incredible mastery. As all our dead champions lay scattered across Summoner's Rift, chat exploded with accusations against our support, Sona, the champion which Sophia was playing. If Sony used W, we would have killed their ADC, someone typed in chat. Why didn't you heal? You weren't on cooldown. Idiot Sona didn't ult, Sona noob. 478, I hope your mom gets cancer. I quickly chipped in, as I didn't want things to get too ugly. Shut up and play. Once I resurrected, I kept on playing, with even sharper focus than before. The enemy team were pretty average in skill, apart from this one guy, so I reckoned we had a chance of winning as long as we capitalized on his mistakes and focused. This made me more determined to play better and fight it out till the end. When I looked at the map after a while, I noticed Sona had resurrected, but was standing at base. She would occasionally shuffle around inside the base, but that was all. When I realized, I became furious. League doesn't allow you to abandon games, so you can't do anything else apart from AFK until it finishes. That's exactly what she was doing, and this match was one we could win. I tried to convince her to snap out of it, and even texted her on WhatsApp. She wouldn't respond to anything, so I decided to play on without her. League was full of blame game and toxicity, so I honestly wondered how she had gotten so far if she was so easily triggered by it. The other members of our team were just as angry, and many began to send harassing messages. We were pretty quickly defeated, and as soon as I exited the game, I entered a new one without her. I was absolutely irate that she had ruined my game. Curse me, blame me, do whatever you want to me, and I'll tolerate. But go AFK on me, and it's over. I felt betrayed and thought she was pathetic and so immature that she couldn't even ignore a few rude remarks. Above all, I didn't need a teammate who valued their own pride more than a team victory. If she was going to act like that, then it would probably damage my win rate more than it did good in future. When she realized I had entered a game without her, she began texting me on WhatsApp. I read her first few messages. They made me cry again. This always happens to me. Why do I have to be so sensitive? Her self-pitying ticked me off, so I turned my phone on silent and kept playing. My results weren't as good as when I played with her, but they were decent enough. In fact, even with the additional defeats, it felt liberating not to be dependent on her anymore. I realized how much I had sucked up to her over the past month or so, and vowed to develop my own skills and stand on my own two feet from then on. After a few games, I decided it was enough and went to sleep. In the morning, 
I woke up to a hundred plus unread messages. I opened WhatsApp, and to my horror, I was greeted with a string of gory images that almost made me vomit. I had just woken up and was completely unprepared to be faced with such a sight. She had made multiple cuts in her arms with a knife and sent the pictures to me. Deep, cross-hatched lacerations. There were large brown stains of her excessive bloodshed on the carpet and bedsheets in the background. I scrolled to the top. Why are you ignoring me? Stop ignoring. Sorry, 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 sorry. The images began after the pleas. She sent me pictures of the various cuts and bruises she had inflicted on her arms, legs and stomach. I thought it was likely my ignoring caused this mess and instantly regretted it. Sophia is typing. Morning. I was afraid of what she might do next. I didn't know what to say. Instead of texting, I voice called her. She declined the first few times, but I kept trying until she picked up. Sophia? Hey. Her voice was meek and quiet. Nice to talk to you, Sophia. Listen, if this is my fault, I'm so sorry. Please don't take this game so seriously. I just want us to have fun. Doing this to yourself over what anyone says or does, even me, is really not worth it. We were both silent for a while. I was crying all night. I thought you wouldn't talk to me again. She sounded as if she was choking. I was just angry at what you did. Sorry for ignoring you. It won't happen again. I have more, but I won't show them all to you. She sent me another image, this time of a phone screen cap. There were more images of blooded cuts in her skin, which she had sent to another number. Who did you send these to? I asked. That's my other phone number. Why are you sending the pictures there? I want to see how they look when you receive them on WhatsApp. Sometimes they crop the picture. I was terrified at this point, and extremely concerned for her well-being. She was clearly incredibly self-conscious and mentally fragile. Have you treated the cuts? I put a bandage on them. Get yourself to a hospital and get treatment for your self-harm. They might be infected and you could get really ill. Seriously. Why do you even care? She suddenly sounded distraught. Because you're my friend and you really scared me? It's not about that damn game. I don't want you to get hurt. Okay, fine. She hung up. I wasn't entirely convinced she would take my advice. That day at school, all I could think about were those bloody images, which had shaken me up badly. I'd never seen wounds in such a graphic detail, captured from every angle. The thick red stuff poured out of the stabs and tears in her arms, staining her furniture and splattered across the walls, clotted up in her carpet. On several occasions, I would hear her screaming and crying in my head. Was it my fault? When I returned home that day, the first thing I did was call Sophia. I asked if she had been to the hospital, and to my relief, she said she had sought treatment. All she wanted to do now was play. For the first time in years, I wasn't feeling in the mood to play at all, but I agreed if it would make her happy. Neither of us were in great condition, and this was reflected in our game performance. We would lose, she would rage, and I could tell that each game was making her increasingly agitated. You're not learning basic skill shots. Have you become dyslexic? 
Look at the goddamn map, noob. Get out of bottom lane. Where is our jungler? I told her to calm down and take a break. And when she refused, I logged off. She became incredibly angry and started to send me threatening texts telling me she'd hack my account and send things to my friends. I decided that I had enough of this emotional abuse over a bloody game and if she didn't calm down in the morning, I would block her for good. The next morning, I received more photos of cuts and bruises all over her limbs. My heart sank as another message came. They took it away. Took what away? I replied. She left me on red for a while, so I got worried and voice called. Who took what away? I repeated when she picked up. My computer. My parents came home from work yesterday and saw the bloodstains. Oh god. They said the games make me violent. Didn't you tell them you enjoyed it? That it was your escape? No excuses, they said. I couldn't do anything. I'm sorry. I didn't know what to say. I have nothing. Nothing left. Sophia, there's more to life than that game. That's exactly what they said to me. Not just like them. I played it to escape their abuse. To forget about all the bullies and liars and fake people. I heard glass smashing in the background. And she screamed and pounded violently on something. I have a hammer. Her voice was suddenly high-pitched and calm. Like an adult talking to a child. She began to laugh. The insane choked giggles erupted into shrieks of scream-like yells. You know what I'm going to do with this hammer? Break all of their trash like they broke me. I'll break it. I'll break it all. Whatever you're about to do, please don't. Sophia? Sophia? I heard the sharp sounds of glass and ceramics shattering in the background. She hung up. I immediately unfriended and blocked her on the game, then blocked her on WhatsApp. Enough was enough, and I did not want to hear from this crazy girl again. I had an awful headache, and I was shaking, so I took some aspirin and went to bed. Exceedingly frustrated, perhaps, but in ignorance of the nightmare that would await me the following morning. At 6.24am the next day, I received a WhatsApp message from a number I didn't recognize, but I immediately knew who it was. I rolled my eyes in frustration, prepared to block and delete. Why did you abandon your support? She was always there to help you. She never left you. She sacrificed herself for you. Do you hate her? One by one, the messages kept coming. My heart started to race, and beads of sweat formed upon my brow. You were supposed to protect each other, help her when times got tough like she helped you. But it's too late now, Josh. Look what happens when you leave your support. An image popped up, and I had to press my hands against my mouth to stop myself from chucking up last night's dinner all over the carpet. It was a dark, grainy image, but there was no mistaking what it was showing. The blue-haired girl I had seen in the photo some time ago was propped up against the wardrobe door, her head drooping to one side. Her eyes had been gouged out of her skull, and in their place were empty sockets. Her nose had been carved off and rested on her cheek like a plastic costume prop, the exposed flesh glimmering underneath. Blood had begun to clot in some areas, and in others, light reflected of the thick liquid, still shiny and oozing. There were lacerations all over her limbs, some old 
and others newly formed. The flesh of her left arm had been torn so severely that a section of bone in her upper arm had been exposed. Her dress was torn, revealing her exposed chest, where she had been stabbed violently multiple times. My phone buzzed. No help? Sona is dead. I screamed. My parents came into the room and I broke down, telling them what happened. They called the police, and after an investigation, they told us French authorities had already been informed. A 15-year-old girl in France had been detained after brutally murdering her younger sister. She had dressed her 14-year-old sister up in a wig and cosplay costume, then tortured and mutilated her body before stabbing her to death. She had no history of self-harm, but was known to have taken her anger out on household objects and other people. After hearing their story, I remembered the bloody pictures of the torn flesh I had been sent. I wretched as they flashed through my mind. The screams accompanying them returned. I curled up in my bed, crying and shaking for an hour after removing all traces of League of Legends from my computer and deleting WhatsApp for good. Those images flash up and plague my mind every time I'm alone in a dark place. These days, I turn away if I see anything to do with the game. I tell people not to use the abbreviation LOL when they send texts to me. I don't play computer games or go to gaming conventions. Nowadays, the only support I need is emotional. And the only things I carry are objects. The summer storm seemed harmless at first. It struck in a hot August night, not unlike tonight. Pretty little alerts buzzed happily on every cell phone inside the safety and sanctity of my living room. My wife, Emily, was the first one to read the emergency message aloud to the group. Flash flood warning in this area, she announced, with misplaced sing-song optimism. Oh, I love watching a good storm. No sooner than she spoke, the evening sky erupted with forks of angry yellow lightning and buckets of cascading rain. Four of us eagerly crowded the bay window to watch. That night, we were entertaining guests at our house in the New Jersey suburbs. Emily's best friend, Diana, was visiting from the city. Unfortunately for me, that meant her annoying and arrogant boyfriend was along for the ride. Aaron was awful. I hoped the storm would save me from another one of his self-righteous sermons. I was wrong. Jeez, this storm is biblical. I started, shaming myself for the bait. Noah's Ark withstood many times this rain, Aaron finished. Isn't that a fun fact? The Lord always provides. It was thankfully hard to hear his nasally voice. The gutters on our middle-class home, an admitted fixer-upper, were filling in seconds. That was about eighth on the long list of things to fix. I cursed myself again for the embarrassment that would surely follow. Well, I believe in morality. That should count for everybody. Emily countered with sass. I believe the basement might be flooded with this much rain. I muttered to no one in particular. Oh, gorgeous, Aaron said sarcastically. Might want to have a guy look at that, bud. That's dangerous if you plan on having kids in here. 
he continued on about having a guy for every homeowner situation, which was really just his wealthy father. I motioned for M to follow me. She met me worriedly in the kitchen. After taking two steps down, it was apparent that I was right about the rain. On the outside of the house, the stairs leading to the basement door are underground. In extreme circumstances, that outdoor stairwell can flood if there's too much water in a short period. If it floods, an avalanche of water will pour into the basement as a means to evacuate the now filled basin of steps on the outside. The end result was that our floors were filthy and covered in inches of water. I mumbled a quick, damn it, and asked M to help me unplug the electrical equipment. In a panic, I turned off the circuit to the entire floor. The lights cut accordingly. We were left in darkness and silence. Suddenly, the only sounds were Aaron's muted voice and the angry pattering of rain. And then, Emily screamed. I sloshed across the cold water and reached out into the inky blackness for her. After a chest-tightening couple of seconds, I wrapped my arms around Em's shaking cold frame and thanked God that she was alright. Call that an overreaction at this stage, but my nerves were already shot, and I thought she got shot. What happened? Are you okay? I asked. Em gasped and caught her breath. Something swam by me. If the prospect of dealing with an insurance provider had not freaked me out already, that did. Panic built up inside my throat like a lump. We need to shovel the water out of the staircase. The drain must be clogged. I started to look for my boots, but they must have floated into the office. I'll be right back. Maybe Aaron will help me. No! Emily shouted suddenly. She gripped my arm so hard that there were red impressions from her fingernails. Don't go outside. It's dangerous. She was right, as always. The wind alone was sure to take down a few trees, not to mention the lightning passing through like a constant, convulsing current. Either of those things made going outside pure stupidity. The emergency alert warned people to stay indoors. I nodded and followed her out. We headed back up to the kitchen like depressed, waterlogged squeak toys. Diana was the first to greet us at the top. Look at the two of you! Did you pop a pipe? I ignored her. So did Emily. We were mad enough, and tolerance for their nonsense had reached an all-time low. Soon enough, Aaron rounded the corner and let out an open guffaw at our drenched clothes and hair. How's the weather down there, guys? Huh? Right? I think I mumbled something about his stupid-looking golf cap. I regret that. Especially now. Emily grasped behind me, but I didn't care at the time. He was an asshole, and he deserved it. I escaped the kitchen into the sanctity of my bedroom in search of some dry clothes. Our old German shepherd, Lola, was locked in there by herself. Aaron did not like dogs, of course. The pup seemed to be taking the tough treatment well, though. She had been quiet all night, but now that I was in there, I could see her head was stuffed under the bed. I reached out to pet her head and was greeted with a nasty snarl in return. Emily's voice echoed through the hallway and pulled me away from the dog before I could give her any concern. Oh my god, Matt! It's hailing! Either the devil was dancing on a rooftop, 
or she was right again. I looked outside and saw fist-sized golf balls and ice punch their way into the pavement of my already chipped driveway. I cursed myself, this time for leaving the car outside. I closed the bedroom behind me and joined the group back in the kitchen. Diana seemed to be following the same line of thought. Emily, the Jag is out there. That stupid car costs more than this house. Can we use your garage? She asked. Well, I guess our cars aren't in there. She shot me a knowing glance. But don't go outside, Di. It's really unsafe. It's just a little ice weather. In August, she snorted. Hey, maybe those asshole scientists are right, huh? Pastor Pete says not to trust it, though. Just another hoax. She pulled open the deck door before we could protest her anymore. This is bonkers, guys. It's freezing. Do you feel this? Are we still in Jersey? I did. The area was so cold that it wafted its way through the kitchen. Subconsciously, the three of us backed away from the open door just as the balls of hail in the sky shifted to pristine snowflakes. Diana, get inside now, Aaron started. I'll be right back, hon. Stop. She counted from the doorway. Diana, you big stupid idiot. Get in this house right now, Aaron said sternly. How holy. Of course, that made Di more mad. She slammed the door and disappeared into the growing fog. And then, it was quiet. We waited for her in silence. At first, it only felt like a minute. Emily was pacing back and forth while I surveyed damage to the rest of the house. A few trees seemed to have fallen in the backyard. The snow was accumulating at a record pace. In what seemed like only a couple minutes, there was already a half foot of it on the ground. The wind whipped back and forth to create drifts of a foot or deeper. I was watching it from the bathroom when Aaron called out for our attention. I never heard a car start. The three of us converged again by the deck door. The backyard was a backdrop of white. It was impossible to see the driveway. Did either of you hear a car? We have to go find her. Aaron continued in a growing frenzy. We cannot go out there. Emily said in a mouse-like tone. Just wait another minute. Aaron looked from me to my wife. I shrugged in his direction. To hell with you both. You belong there with your morality nonsense. Open the door. Aaron pushed them out of the way in his haste. Before he got halfway there, I grabbed him by the collar and threw him out the door myself. Then I slammed it shut. The house was then quiet again. We were left with Aaron's golf cap, thrown back inside with the wind. I was just about to remark about what an asshole he was, when suddenly an enormous roar punched through the storm. Emily and I darted to the deck window to check it out. At first, there was nothing to see. Waves of snow sheets encompassed every corner and tree branch on our property. Visibility was low. But then, in the corner of the yard, a flash of red jacket alerted my eyes to a shape moving quickly by the driveway. It was Aaron. He was trying to run across the snow, but he wasn't getting far. He kept looking behind him at something 
just outside my line of sight. After a few feet, he seemed to give up altogether and fall helplessly to the ground. Then the thing behind him came into focus. Oh god, oh my god, oh my god, Matt, look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it, what is that? The snow blocked most of my view, but some facts were easily discernible. In comparison to Aaron, the creature stood at least three feet taller. Its back was hunched, and its skin was covered in a matted, dark-coloured hair. It followed our former friend, Lazily. There was no haste to its movement. When it caught him, it lifted him up in the air like a chew toy. The sickening crunch was more than enough for me to grab Emily and hold her eyes up against my shoulder. Neither of us needed to see any more. My first instinct was to lock the doors. Lola was barking, and that would draw attention. I knew whatever was outside would soon set its sight on the house. I grabbed Em's hand and ran to lock each lock. For once, I thanked myself for spending money on security that summer. When that was done, we huddled in the bathroom with a dog and waited it out. It was quiet again. I know, given the absolute mess that we had just witnessed outside our own house, you would think it would be panic. But Lola now knew to be silent. She took to a spot under the bed. Emily whimpered, but her voice was muffled under the covers. I watched the snow. The snow was not stopping. After only an hour or so, more than a foot had piled up. There is always a stillness in nature when such a storm occurs, but there was something too still. Sure enough, movements later, the loud crunch of footsteps outside confirmed my theory. Open the door, echoed a familiar and haunting voice from somewhere in the distance. You two idiots, open the door. Emily and Lola both cried by my side. I felt helpless. Something started to tap at the walls of the house. It ran back and forth and tapped each door and window it could find, like it was searching for weaknesses. The noise sounded like long nails clicking against the wood frames. Seemingly frustrated, the voice called out again, this time with a horrible parody of Diana's obnoxious accent. Look at the two of you, just another hoax. The curious scratching focused on the front door, then it turned into a vicious pounding. This is bonkers, it screeched with a horrible, throaty laugh. It coughed. The voice was horribly disjointed as it switched between Diana and Aaron's two very different tones. Open the door. The Lord always provides. Open the door. The Lord always provides. Open the door. Please, Matt. Open the door. Please, Emily. Open the door. Open the door. Open the door. Open the door. Emily screamed alongside it in a hysterical, horribly wounded, yet still battle-ready tone of her voice. Go screw yourselves. Then she did something I had never seen her do in five years of marriage. She got down to one knee and prayed. The prayer was not to anyone in particular. M was never that religious. I could not even hear much of what she was saying through the horrible banging outside. But somehow, 
she looked at peace. She thanked someone, anyone, for our life. She thanked them for our house, and for our memories inside. For all the warm times and holidays spent around the fireside, with seasons of Netflix and cases of bottled wine. She thanked them, all of them, any and all gods that might be present on earth on that hellish evening. And when she finished, she offered them one final line. If someone is watching what is happening to us, she started to sob desperately among the scrapes. Please help. Something answered. The pounding receded, weakly at first. Then the great footsteps that arrived exited the same way they came. After another agonizingly silent hour, the snow started to taper and disappear altogether. Moonlight crept through the windows as the clouds receded and snow melted swiftly in the rising sun. When the morning came, the weather finally died down. Our friends were reported missing. They have not been found. Tonight is the one year anniversary of their disappearance. There is a warning for another severe storm. We will not be opening the door. Great men do not lie still in death. Our words echo across time, a light for others to follow when their own fires burn low. Thus shall my torch be taken up again. Thus shall I dwell once more among the living. Those were the last lines Alexander Notovich ever wrote. I know they belong to him because I watched his frail hand tremble a torturous route across the page. I know they were his last, because I watched him die in that leather chair the same evening. You may have never heard of him, but I guarantee you've seen the light of his torches. Alexander wrote in a hundred different styles under a hundred different names. His work has sold millions of copies and has been translated into 442 languages. But the most important thing he's ever written, his magnum opus, has never been read by anyone except me. I think he would have died years ago if it wasn't for that book. Alexander was never married, and neither did he keep any friends. I don't think anyone could stand to be in the same room as him for long enough for that. The dark scrutiny of his eyes pierced the most sacred part of you, leaving you naked in a way you have never even seen yourself. The only reason I endured the weight of his frightful presence was the promise of publishing his final volume. I have always fancied myself as a writer. Reading that book humbled me to my core. I read the whole thing in a single 14 hour stretch after his death. The poetry of his words taught me what it was to be human, yet made mockery of my presumption to call myself the same species as him. I wept many times through the silent vigil of that reading, but it wasn't for loss of the man. I wept that the highest peak of my life would never rise above the lowest shadow of his. I hated myself for how hollow my ideas were, knowing my intellect to be forever incapable of approaching his mastery. It wasn't fair. If I had written that book instead of him, then I would never need to prove myself again. 
if I wrote it. But who is to say I didn't? Only a dead man in these empty halls. What good was fame to him who hid behind pseudonyms as impenetrable as the veil of death? I took a pen from Alexander's desk and wrote my own name at the head of his manuscript. Though only a single line had changed, I could feel the holy relic in my hands somehow turn into a thing of evil. No more was this a testament to the greatness in man, but rather a tribute to his most vile and jealous desires. I couldn't bear to look at the thing anymore. I hold it down upon the dead man's desk, half expecting it to burn a hole straight through. Yet there, the crumpled sheets lay, a forgotten pile of rubbish, but for me. I reverently sorted the papers once more, and, opening the word presser on my laptop, began to type. I watched my fingers write my own name at the top, and I did nothing to stop them. It took several days to type the entire manuscript, made longer by my constant need to reread passages that I'd somehow skipped the first time. It wasn't a matter of two pages sticking together either. There were unfamiliar sentences with memorable paragraphs, unnoticed notes in the margin, and even a whole chapter that I had never seen before. It was almost as though someone had edited the work during the night. I dutifully recorded them regardless, telling myself that I had been too excited to register them the first time around. I didn't allow myself to question the genius until I'd reached the very last sentence of the very last paragraph on the very last page. Thus is my torch taken up again. Thus I dwell once more among the living. The first time I read that line, it was written in the future tense. Now it was written in the present. I was sure of it. The lines had been steered into my mind as surely as my own name. Alexander's house no longer felt as empty as it had a moment before. Those who have stood alone beneath a storm-ravaged sky would understand the brooding electricity I felt around me. The soft whir of the overhead fan seemed to grow louder, its motion stirring the papers on the desk for the first time. Before my eyes, the metal beads beneath the fan slid downward until a clear click resonated. The fan increased in speed again. I fumbled my way out of the chair and reached to turn it off. But before I could, the chain had already pulled once more. The blades were slowing on their own accord. In the sudden silence of the dread air, I heard footsteps downstairs. They were soft and deliberate, a panther stalking an unsuspecting prey. I raced to the top of the staircase to settle my rebellious imagination, but stopped short as I reached the first step. The outdoor porch light had just turned off. A second later, the kitchen light extinguished, then the living room directly below the wooden stairs, dissolving the whole first floor into shadows. The creak as someone stepped on the bottom stair. Footsteps again, faster now, something sprinting directly up the flight of steps in an avalanche of buckling wood. I yelped and scrambled backward into Alexander's study. I couldn't hear the footsteps over the thunder of my own blood. I slammed the door behind me. There wasn't a lock so I thrust my back against the door and braced my legs against the floorboards to pin it shut. Straining with static tension, I forced slow breaths and willed the drum roll of my heart to slow enough for me to listen. 
nothing. So quiet that there was no marker to separate the fleeting seconds. The frozen moment colourless and eternal. So quiet that I could almost hear the self-deprecating laughter of my own thoughts. I was being absurd. All I'd really seen was an electrical abnormality. More the rule than the exception in an old house like this. The sound. The soft tread that I'd mistaken for footprints. Nothing but the thrumming of a blown fuse or transformer outside. Alright, wise guy. My thoughts seemed to retort. Then why don't you explain those shuffling sounds running up and down the doorframe? Those dry, dusty snorts, like methodical sandpaper grating against rough wood. The study lights cut with such vicious swiftness that I jolted and grunted in sudden alarm. The sniffing doubled in urgency in response, something butting against the door on the other side with an assault which grew more frenzied by the second. Soon, I was heaving with exertion, each blow making my skeleton dance to a tune that the rest of me didn't hear. Three inches or more, I'd be pushed back, and before my full weight had even slammed the door into its frame, another numbing cascade would ricochet through my body, and I'd be flying again. And then the howl. A chilling echo of a sound buried deep within the dormant animal instinct of my psyche. A sound more beast than any man, yet more man than any beast, for the tortured guttural syllables which rolled across its alien tongue. More terrible than the splintering door, more terrible than the bestial anthem or the shrill symphony of my nerves, came the pitter-patter of gentle keys and a soft shadow blocking the light. As horrifying as the creature sounded beyond the door, at least it was on the other side. Illuminated by the halo of my computer's light, I saw a strange creature hunched over the keyboard. Its shoulders extended so far past its head and stretched the skin of its back so transparently thin that it appeared like a deformed bat. A dozen long, crooked fingers on each hand deftly picked out the keys one by one, each bending subtly with several too many joints. I couldn't leave my post at the door without letting the other monster in, so I was helpless but to stare as the thing completed its work. Once satisfied, it leaned back in the chair and stretched its arms luxuriously behind its body, the elbows bending 90 degrees in the opposite direction to wrap around itself. At once, the pressure on the other side of the door vanished. The dry sniffing left a moment later, growing fainter until I could hear the creak descending down the stairs. No longer needing to hold the door, I cautiously approached my computer and the thing in the chair. It watched me with beady fascination, tracking my slightest movement with an adjustment from its head. I got just close enough to read the title page and see that my name had been removed. The original pen name that Alexander had written was in its place. You wrote this? I asked the creature. It shook its head and pointed a long finger out the door. The creature pulled itself out of the chair in a sudden lurch, causing me to backpedal. Dragging itself by the arms, useless vestigial legs sliding behind, the thing moved to the bookshelf in the corner and produced another volume. It pointed at the book, then at itself. But there were hundreds of them, I said. The creature swept its two flexible arms in an encompassing gesture. The distant shuffle in the attic, the creaking on the stair, 
the rush of shadow behind the waste paper basket, all absorbed in an instant. To think I was jealous of the old man. All he's ever done is sell the books these mutant monsters have produced. And if I'm careful, and if I'm kind to them, then through me, they all write a hundred more. I knew my life would be terrible once I started working at Wendy's. I started working at Wendy's when I realized my mom had stopped wanting to pay my college funds. I needed to pay my rent, and the nearest work available was a local Wendy's. I ended up working there anyway, and impressed the manager enough to have a suitable income for my situation. Finally, I had enough money to pay my rent and support myself. Things were good, but I was still looking for other jobs that related to my studies over at college. We had a small staff, consisting of only 12 people. After about a year, I was granted the job of supervisor. One quiet night, we were ready to work all night. My shift was all the way from 10pm to 8 in the morning. I thought it would be a slow, boring night, with nothing more than me and another four people. The four people were an old man named Jim and a few teenage girls. I was the supervisor for the night, and my boss decided to leave us. Most of the night, there were no customers to speak of, well, except for this one guy. He was pretty fat, and I guessed that there were some people who wanted the chicken fix at 12 at night. After 12, all of us just stood at our posts, sometimes talking, sometimes not. I just looked at the drive through camera most of the time, looking for something that caught my eye. I did notice a car coming in from the drive through entrance. Gear up guys, I told them, there's a customer. The car was a yellowish 56 Chevy convertible. And he's got a sweet car, I said to make things more interesting. I picked up the headset and spoke into the mic. Hello, welcome to Wendy's. May I take your order? After a few seconds of silence, I heard whispering, or a quiet speaking of some sort. This was a bit weird, and I just asked again. Uh, sorry, sir. Could you repeat that order again? After a few minutes of silence, I just regarded the whole situation as odd. I looked over to my co-workers and shrugged. I could tell that Jim was getting impatient. I asked again. Could you give me that order again, please? There was silence again. Before I could ask again, Jim took the headset from me. Sir, could you please just... He was cut off by something. By what? I don't know. The colour faded away from his face immediately. He ripped off the headset and ran to the employee washroom, crying. I was shocked that such a senile old man could break so easily. One of the girls chased him. I put on the headset and heard static. I saw that the cord was cut. God Damn it, Jim, you broke the headset. I looked at the screens, and neither of them had the yellow convertible. Fifteen minutes later, one of the girls came back with Jim. He said he heard his mother's voice. I didn't know whether to yell at him, to stop being so crazy, or sympathize with him. I just told him to get back to work and that I'll take care of the drive through The girls clearly looked worried and a bit scared. As a supervisor, I had to keep all of my staff under control and working. 
I told them just to get back to their posts and wait for me to give them any orders that came through. Earlier on, I had no idea as to what happened. I was thinking of ways that this could be possible. Were we being pranked? I thought, as I looked through the cameras once more. Had they just messed with us on the mic and sped right past the window? No, they couldn't have. I would have heard the engine right outside. I wasn't a skeptic in earlier parts of my life, but recently I had stopped believing in such things. I didn't know whether I was losing touch with my religion or maybe my lack of belief in the supernatural. Needless to say, I had a lesser amount of logic in my mind than before tonight. It was about an hour later that some weird things started going on. We were all a little tired and we were all about to take mini shifts where we would all take quick naps. I looked down at the cameras once more and noticed a bit of fuzz going on. I tapped the screen lightly and that seemed to fix it for a couple of seconds. It started to get a bit more fuzzy than before after I tried to fix it again. After a few more times of fixing it, I noticed something peculiar going on in the top right corner of the screen. There was some guy in a hoodie walking down the sidewalk that was just barely out of view. After the hoodie guy had passed, there was another guy just seconds afterwards. Hey guys, check this out, I said, pointing to the screen. Once I had said that, the guy stopped and looked over to the camera. I felt like he heard me somehow. He then continued to walk, and then there was no more of the hoodie guy. Never mind. The screen started to clear up again. By that time, I had really started to get tired. I would have taken a nap, but for some reason, there's a rule about the supervisor not taking naps. And knowing Jim, he'd rat me out in a second. So, I went to the office that was in the back and just did some paperwork that needed to be taken care of. I just needed to fill out what was used in the night and how much we made. It's actually very simple stuff. While I was working on the papers, I noticed this red piece of paper that was in the pile. I picked it out and read it. It said, The Freezer. Of course, I could understand it, but the writing was very sloppy and reminded me a bit of a cover of a Goosebumps book. I chuckled a bit and went to consult my co-workers. I asked them if they had left the piece of paper in the office, but all they said in return was, The office has been locked all day. We're too tired to pull any pranks. I just left it in the office and went to check on the cameras. I got to the cameras, only to find them busted. All the screens were cracked, and the headset was emitting this weird static noise. Guys, who the hell did this? I questioned in an extremely angry tone. I thought I heard something, said one of the girls. What did you hear? She seemed to have a higher IQ than the other girls, who just seemed to text on their phones half the day. So I was surprised to see that she didn't check the noise. I heard a bit of tapping and then a loud banging sound. It only lasted for a couple of seconds, so I thought someone else was over there. I thought you were over there, said one of the other girls, texting on her phone. Why their phones have so much power, I'll never understand. Well, I wasn't, I said in a shaky voice. For the next few minutes, we just stood there, not talking. It was kind of eerie, actually. It was all silent, 
and I could hear nothing except the static of the headset. The headset, I thought, realizing the cord had been broken earlier. I ran over to the headset, checking to see if my theory was going anywhere. Sure enough, I was correct. The cord was completely disconnected, but it was still making noise. I felt my blood run cold and the hairs on my neck stand up as I slowly put on the headset. All I heard was a disarray of static, and I didn't even know what to say, so I stammered out a weak, hello? As soon as I spoke, the headset blared out aloud and disoriented. The freezer. It was so loud that I ripped off the headset as soon as I heard it. After that, I told them not to go anywhere near the freezer. As the night went on, I tried to get the screens fixed, but I couldn't, so I just told the girls to watch the windows every once in a while. It started to get a little hot, which was strange since it was the middle of October. All I knew was that it was always cool during the night. I regarded it as just a change in temperature. The night went on, silently and eerily. I made the same hourly rounds, and it was nearly four in the morning when I noticed one of the other girls had left. What happened? I asked Jim, since he knows a lot about what's happening, more than me. How am I supposed to know? He snapped back, snarling a bit as he did so. Aren't you supposed to keep track of them? I ain't no babysitter. I'm just doing my job. He was right. This could badly affect my performance, or ruin the stable relationship I have with my manager. I looked in the back and saw that all her stuff was gone. Where could she have gone? I thought as I opened her locker. Her phone was still there, so she couldn't have gone far. I went over to the screens and tried to fix them again to see if I could make some more progress. About an hour later, I finally fixed the screens. By this time, I was sweating like a dog in the desert. It was so hot that the air was almost like warm blankets. I looked at the screen and all of them were this dark shade of red. Oh damn, I said to myself as I saw the body of a teenage girl at the bottom left corner of the camera's view. I ran to the window and tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. In fact, none of the windows would open. I ran to the back door and tried to open it. I have to get out there, I thought, as I tried my best to bust down the door. It would not open, no matter how hard I tried. By now, I was feeling weak and I noticed that no one else was around except for me. I looked out of the drive through window at an angle so I could see what exactly happened. It looked like someone had ran over her with a tractor. Blood was everywhere, and it looked like some of her entrails were splattered along the walls. I gagged at the sight. I ran to the front of the restaurant and tried to exit through the glass doors that led inside. I looked for something to break open the windows. I wanted to break out of here so badly, but at the same time, I wanted to be cold. I was getting so tired of the blistering heat. I went over behind the counter and disconnected the cash register. I threw it at the glass, but the glass seemed to reflect it back at me. It hit me directly in the knee. I had a loud crunch coming from my knee and my leg went limp. I fell to the ground and couldn't get back up. I heard something making a hissing noise behind me. It was the grill. It was hissing and the grease traps were smoking. The grill suddenly burst into flames which made the heat unbearable. I crawled over to the steel door of the freezer. It felt so cold against my head. If 
felt so nice. I flicked the handle with my hand. Then, I pushed the door open to escape into the cold. I crawled inside and saw the lights flicker on as if by magic. They were waiting for me there. Finally, I met with my co-workers in the nice cold. They were just hanging on the meat racks. I crawled deeper inside and let the nice cold sweep me off the ground and onto the steely cold of the meat rack. Perpetual darkness lingered at the top of the world. Thick ice, frigid air, and snow covered the lifeless mountainscape. However, the endless night did not go unchallenged. A single source of light illuminated the sky and drove back the darkness. Nestled between two snow-covered mountains, a little cottage sat with puffy, billowing smoke rising from its chimney. Ignoring the fact that the nearest civilization was thousands of miles away, to the casual eye, the house was simply a warm and welcoming home. Still, one might ask themselves, what an odd thing to find in such a bleak place. How could such a thing come to be? Like most things found in the North Pole, not everything is as it appears. The land was unforgiving and cruel. It could take your life within minutes. Only a select number of creatures were given permission to live in this harsh and relentless wilderness. All others who entered this domain did it of their own accord, such as the residents of this tiny little home. However, these individuals were like no other, and with a little bit of magic at their disposal, they lived happy and joyful lives. At first glance, it would appear it was nothing more than a simple, ordinary home inhabited by an elderly couple who loved each other dearly. If this were your conclusion, you would be mistaken. In reality, a magical secret existed below, for the small house was much more than meets the eye. The little house was not just a home, but the tip of a mystical workshop hidden beneath the ice. For centuries, children around the world found joy from the efforts of the hidden workshop. All year round, tiny magical hands toiled and laboured to create toys and playthings for all the good children of the world. Elves, the last of the magical creatures from old, dwelt within the walls and used their mystical nature to create wondrous and joyful things for Christmas morning. Two days after the winter solstice, the old man would put on his heavy coat and boots, take to the air and deliver his Christmas joy to every last child. Like everything in the cosmos, there must be a balance. For every night there must be a day, for every beginning has an end. And, with every kind of child, there was a naughty little boy or girl to be found. Far below the bright lights, singing and happy elves creating and building new, fantastic toys, there was another workshop. There, the warmth of the hearthstones could not reach. While the purpose of the upper workshop was to bring happiness, the other was dark and sterile. It too had a purpose. It was where the masses of cheap and easily broken toys were made. There was no love put into these objects. Never would a child's eyes brighten with wonder and awe upon seeing these gifts on Christmas morning. In his wisdom, the old man knew that even a naughty child should not be forgotten during this time of goodwill. However, the old man was no fool and had no desire to waste his resources 
and such unsatisfying tasks. This responsibility was handed to the banished and exiled elves that inhabited the deepest bellows below the workshop. Those with selfish hearts and greedy desires. Stripped of their immortality, they wasted away in the dark, with only the trinkets and flimsy materials to pass the time. Erika Attar sat in the poorly lit corner of the tattered workbench. His focus was entirely devoted to the old and worn piece of brass in his hand. The clangs of his hammer hitting metal rang out and echoed through the dark halls and passageways. He pounded the brass sheet relentlessly until the metal slowly began to surrender its shape and bend to Erga's design. Suddenly, the hammer flew out of the mad elf's grasp. He examined his limp hand, trying to will it back into his control. Fury filled his heart as he watched the necrotic flesh slowed of his bony hand. He didn't have much time. His other hand was weak, but still capable of grasp. He reached into his toolbox and removed a long, warped nail and stabbed it into the back of his paralyzed hand. He pushed on the nail head until its tip broke through the skin and emerged through his palm. Immediately, the pain surged and shot up his arm. The thick and rigid tendons loosened within his hand, giving him temporary use of his digits once more. The elf picked up his hammer and resumed molding the shape of the brass plate. With each impact upon the brass, he poured his rage into his creation. How ironic that the product of his tireless work was meant for the ones he hated the most. His deteriorating body was fading fast. He possessed just enough magic to fuel the curse he would cast upon the object. When finished, his gift would be placed with the other junk toys and cheap trinkets. It would make its way to them and find a child on Christmas morning. The curse will take hold and slowly begin tearing apart their lives. It will channel their essence back to him and reignite his immortality. The object would pass from one child, then another, century after century. He had just enough magic left to invoke this curse. Erga had once lived and worked above. Like any other elf before him, he loved nothing more than to create beautiful and wondrous toys and gizmos. However, in his heart, he wished that he could keep some of his creations for himself. One day, his eyes fell upon a beautiful music box his friend Delilah had created. The music box was extraordinary, meant as a gift to a king's firstborn. It was magnificent. Crafted from oak wood, it bore an elaborate gold design on each of its sides. When opened, a figurine of two children opening their gifts under a Christmas tree spun to a lovely medley. Erika Eta had never desired anything more in his entire life. It filled his heart with jealousy. He became resentful that this precious and rare treasure would go to an undeserving human infant. The little girl didn't deserve it. It should go to him, he thought. So, under the cover of darkness, Erika slipped into the work area and took the music box. Unable to sleep and anxious to put the finishing touches on his prized creation, Delayla decided to return to the workshop. To his surprise and shock, he caught the elf attempting to steal the special music box. Delayla was enraged, for greed and thievery among elves were extremely offensive and not tolerated. Erika begged his friend to not report his transgression, but Delilah was unmoved by the pleas and turned to tell the others of Erika's crime. Desperate, 
Erega did the only thing left for him to do. He grabbed a hammer and brought it down on his friend's head over and over again, until no more life remained in the broken body. Despite his meticulous efforts to conceal his crime, he could not escape the sight and wisdom of the old man. Humiliated and dishonored, the elf was banished from the workshop and his precious music box was taken from him and given to the little princess. Stripped of his immortality, Erika Eta was cast into the cold and dark corridors of the other workshop to spend his remaining days, never to create a beautiful thing again. As the seasons passed, his hatred for all children grew and ate away at his sanity. He gritted his teeth, knowing that the children of man were given everything, and he had nothing. Hunched over his work, Erika feverishly worked to complete his masterpiece. He stared down at the anvil and hammered down on the brass. Each strike brought the faces of a child into his mind. It lives in warmth. The blunt hammer formed the metal into a hollow cylinder. It stuffs its face with sweets and treats. Stumpy legs were welded into place. It gets everything it asks from mummy and daddy. A malformed head and crooked ears took shape. It gets anything. The brass surface was scrubbed of debris and grime. It gets everything. Small turquoise stones were glued onto the brass body. I hate it. One glimmering red ruby stone was glued to the left side of the figurine's head. I hate it. A second ruby was then fixed onto the right. I hate them all. In the glow of the fire, Erika held up the brass figurine. It was a disturbing representation of a rabbit. Its body was a lattice of crisscrossed brass strips, bejeweled with a pale blue turquoise stone on each intersection. Its head was malformed and gave the impression of a dead thing instead of a pleasant rabbit full of life. He placed the atrocious thing upon an open silver locket that contained a mirror on each of the hinged inner sides. With the rabbit figurine facing one of the mirrors, he carefully opened a vial that held a clear fluid. It was lymph from the elves. The lymph was the source of magic that flowed through their bodies like that of blood from the second set of unique arteries. The magic lymph had its own circulatory system and heart. It was the vital system that gave the elf their magic abilities. Only a few tiny drops fell out of the vial. It splashed onto the figurine and mirrored locket, illuminating them with a golden glow. Erga closed his eyes and spoke the words of Wormwood in his elven tongue. The clear liquid turned black and stained the surface of both the rabbit statuette and the silver locket. The glow turned a deep purple, then slowly faded. Pleased with the outcome, he gently placed the cloth over the object to obscure it from sight and ever so carefully placed it in a small box decorated with holiday cheer. Finished with his work, Erika turned to leave, pushing past the corpses of several elves hanging upside down from the support beams of the other workshop. Their lifeless bodies drained completely of every last drop of magical lymph. Erika's calculation had been correct. He had just enough magic to fuel the curse placed on the object. The mad elf smiled and began to laugh. For the first time in a very long time, Erika at his heart filled with anticipation at the approach of Christmas morning. The little girl sat in a large pile of torn wrapping paper from the many gifts she found under the Christmas tree. On the morning of December 22nd, 
Gabby awoke earlier than everyone else. She went downstairs and glared at the many presents that continuously tempted her. It was as if they teased and mocked her every time she looked at the colourful and beautiful wrapping paper. She would receive such a terrible scolding from her parents, but she couldn't wait any longer. At first, it would only be one gift she opened, then it became two, then another, and another. Before she knew it, all of her presents had been opened. Despite getting everything she asked for, the desire for more still was not satisfied. When Gabby stood, a small gift next to the base of the tree caught her eye. She could have sworn it had not been there before. The wrapping paper was worn and yellowed with age. Written in big words was a tag that said, To Gabriella. It was like no other, and she surely would have seen it before now. Puzzled, she removed the wrapping paper and found a box that contained a smaller sealed box and a scroll. She opened the scroll and read, Congratulations, lucky one. You are the proud owner of Pepe the rabbit. Pepe loves you and will be your best friend in the whole world. Pepe is a friend like no other, and he will give you everything your heart desires. To be Pepe's friend, you must listen to him and never disobey the following instructions. Number one, place Pepe on his locket facing the mirror. Number two, never look Pepe in the eyes. He's ever so bashful and only likes to see you through his mirror. Number three, you may ask anything of Pepe three times. In three days time, he will grant any and all you asked of him. Number four, never look Pepe in the eyes. It bears repeating, he does not like it and will be upset if you disobey this rule. Remember, lucky little boy or girl, Pepe loves you. He loves you more than anyone else in the whole wide world. Pepe will make sure that no one will ever hurt you again. And if you love Pepe, you will listen to him and do whatever he asks of you. Pepe loves you and no one can ever come between you and him. Pepe loves you. Being a carer is becoming a more in-demand job each year. Wonderful Strides in Medicine has made life expectancy boom. And so, full-time workers to help look after old-timers is a need. Sadly, not every person makes it to their end years fully intact. To put it politely, the woman I cared for, unfortunately, lost the marbles a bit. I look forward to the era where dementia is no longer a factor to how you spend the wonderful retirement years so many people look forward to. Her name was Sally and she had a very young attitude, literally. She was in the constant mindset that she was about nine years old. One way or another, she would explain away certain aspects about her life, how she couldn't run with the other kids because they weren't nice to her. In reality, they were just creeped out at the old lady trying to chase them around. Why she wasn't in school, since they wouldn't let her enter why she lived alone. But the delusions would keep up day in and day out. I tried to help her break out of this mindset at first, but saw the futility over time and learned it was much easier to get her to cooperate by playing along. She would greet me like a favourite babysitter in the mornings. During the day, I'd take her around to do errands. Shopping was sometimes an ordeal, a childlike mentality, making her reach out for sweets and ice cream, 
often throwing a fit when she couldn't get what she wanted. It's a surreal experience seeing such childish behaviour from someone so old. The fun times were going to the park. We would go during the day to avoid the other kids, me knowing they were at school. She would waddle over to the swings and get me to push them. Sometimes she dared to try the slide, though after a few attempts she often claimed it was boring, though it was obvious it was causing her a bit of discomfort and pain. During our downtime, we'd talk a lot. Despite having the mentality of a kid, she tells so many stories about her life. She remembered a lot about her past, despite her failing memory, though you'd have to excuse the narrative as it was often told in the perspective of a kid, no matter the situation, even when it didn't make any sense. She'd sometimes make other people in her life kids too. Her late husband played the role of a boy in her school that she fawned over, the childlike innocence adding a charm to her tales. She would sometimes tell me stories about things we'd done together too, sadly forgetting that I was there when it happened. I didn't mind though. It was lovely seeing her so enthused and cheery. A rare sight sometimes when working with people with that condition. And it was nice hearing how much I positively added to her life. We got along great over the years. Through the troubles, I had figured out a lot about her. The only thing I couldn't piece together was a reoccurring event she told me about. During our downtime conversations, she'd sometimes tell me about a doll she played with. She would regale me with the imaginary adventures she had with it, often fairy tale in nature, which at first was fun to hear. It's hard to describe the interesting imagination of an old person who thinks like a child. It created a surreal mix of young and adult fiction. Imagine taking the tone of the first and last Harry Potter book and mixing them together. It was a concoction of narratives that she weaved together into amazing little stories, something I wished I had written down. What made them stand out to me was the time period. They often made current references, as if they had happened not too long ago. This led me to believe she had a doll and created these fictions while I was away, rather than an old doll she was reminiscing about. But. No matter how much I searched, I could never find the doll she spoke of. Whenever I'd ask her about it, she would tell me she played with her doll when I left. I didn't just try once to find it, it became almost a weekly ritual. While I cleaned her house, I'd keep an eye out for a doll, or anything that resembled a doll. I found the broken top end of a mop which to me looked like it could have been played with like doll's hair. I pointed it out to her, but she denied the correlation. I found some ripped up papers bundled together. I thought it could be used as a figure, but again, she told me I was wrong. Whether she was embarrassed or relished in keeping a secret from me, she never showed me what she played with when I left. Sally carried this secret to a grave. I was sad to hear, but one night, she peacefully passed away not long after I'd left one of my shifts. I was heartbroken. I'd spent the better part of five years getting close with her. She was a lovely client, and I didn't realise how attached I'd gotten until I got the morbid call. I ended up taking a good few weeks off to grieve, often travelling to our favourite spots and reminiscing about her. To the world, she was another grain of sand blew away in the breeze, but to me, she was part of my world. There was a small investigation, as authorities often have to rule out foul play. 
Sadly, not every carer is a good egg, and sometimes blame can be shifted to a person if negligence or other motives come into play. With this in mind, I initially wasn't shocked when I was contacted by the police to come in for an interview. When I arrived at her house, I was taken back by the scene. Police tape wrapped around the property, and a mix of formal investigators and hazard suit adorned figures moved in and out. After explaining who I was to an officer at the front, I was escorted into a room and interviewed. They started with pleasantries and a few inquisitive questions. I cooperated the best I could, and once they saw that, they jumped into the meat of what they were after. First, they asked questions related to little girls. I told them everything about her condition and went into great detail about her belief of being a child. I explained how I catered towards it and thought nothing wrong about encouraging this harmless behaviour. At this, the interrogators looked at each other and bluntly told me to follow them. They led me around the all too familiar property, now defiled by clinical forensic equipment and investigation markings scattered around the house. They pulled me in front of the closet, which I was familiar with. What I wasn't familiar with was the now open hole at the back of the walk-in. It was a crawl space that I'd never seen before. They told me, in great detail, that they'd found the body of a little girl. She was apparently decayed beyond visual recognition. She was also dressed up in an old-fashioned formal dress, something you'd imagine an upper-class Victorian girl to wear. I was silent at this, but what they told me next made me exclaim in both shock and realization. The child's joints were flexed a lot post-mortem, and despite the decrepit features worn away with rot, an abundance of makeup was plastered across her face. In their words, it resembled the look of a child's doll. Living in Lower Alabama, we rarely receive snow. I spent most of my life wishing for a white Christmas. A white Christmas that never came. I have only seen snow twice in my 33 years here. I always wanted to share that with my two boys. I just knew that they would love to play in it. Now, I find myself staring out my window at the mounds of that icy precipitation surrounding my home, regretting every wish I had ever made for a snow-covered Christmas. When I think about it, it really started in summer. Our summers are always hot and extremely humid, but that year it was even more unbearable. We steadily saw temperatures of well over a hundred degrees, and everyone I knew begged for relief. The heat wave lasted all the way until the week before Halloween. Then suddenly, a massive hurricane spawned in the Gulf of Mexico. The weather forecaster for our local news frequently referred to it as a monster. Looking back, I would believe it was more of a demon. A demon that brought hell with it, but much different than the one I had read about in the Bible. The storm passed, leaving devastation for miles around. It had affected every state within the southeast, but Florida most of all. Help was sent from various utility companies, government aid agencies, and even regular citizens to help with the relief. 
and when I say various, I mean from every state in our region. It was amazing to see the effort put forth to help the people that had lost everything. I am sure a lot of us thought that was the worst it could get. I wish that had been true, but that was when the rain started. As November came, we felt the first droplets in our tiny town. It was an odd occurrence, but not odd enough to raise any eyebrows. I mean, how bad could a couple of days of rain be, right? The problem came when days turned into weeks and low-lying areas became flooded. Homes in towns nearby were washed away in a matter of hours once the levees broke. My wife, Susan, constantly thanked God that our house was nested in a high elevation among trees. I found myself thinking the same thing, but God had nothing to do with what happened. No God I could ever believe in, anyway. The week of Thanksgiving, the rain finally subsided, and I am sure there was something everyone would say they were thankful for. The problem was... What remained was the cold. That in itself was not strange, but the severity of it was. We saw temperatures close to freezing for the following week, and that was something we rarely saw until late January or early February. My oldest son, Jacob, began singing that silly song by Bing Crosby. My wife beamed at the thought of them seeing snow on Christmas Day. The foolish child in me felt the same. The boys will finally get to see snow, Paul, Susan squealed. I know, I can't wait to see Tommy waddling in it, I responded. Those words ringing my head, even now. I have to fight back tears when I think of just how stupid I'd been. We were so preoccupied with setting up decorations and buying presents that we were oblivious to what was happening all around us. The snow actually started falling the first week of December. It was up several inches within the first day. It was amazing to see at first, but when it kept coming, some people became worried. If you have never been in the south when it snows, you probably would not understand. You see, we are not prepared for that kind of weather. Everything shuts down. People stay home and rarely go out driving. I know it sounds ridiculous to anyone else, but that is what happens. It just kept coming. My wife and I had let the boys play in the fresh powder originally, but it had gotten so high that I could barely walk in it freely. We decided it was best to keep them indoors. Hardware stores had started bringing in snow shovels to help clear paths, something that you rarely found in our town. I bought one of the last ones on the shelf as people scrambled to manage the icy foreign invader. The situation seemed to become worse, as small flurries became near blizzards. My wife stayed glued to the news and weather broadcasts. It appeared the North States had almost been buried in the frigid powder. The president had actually issued a state of emergency, urging people in the northern portion to evacuate south. That was when I finally started to be concerned. These people had been told to come south, but our situation was hardly any better. The weatherman stopped trying to be accurate. His predictions of an end to the madness never came. The temperatures continued to drop, and it was not long before we saw them go from zero to negative digits. It was unheard of in my state for it to be that cold, and people were getting afraid. Plumbing fixtures began to burst from frozen pipes, and people were left without water until they could thaw. 
our world had become a freezer in a few weeks, and none of us were prepared for it. My family found themselves wearing our thickest clothing, even inside. I felt like, no matter how high I set the thermostat, it was not enough. We should have left then. By Christmas, we had no power, and utility companies had stopped trying to traverse the harsh conditions to repair downed lines. Local officials had abandoned emergency protocols to save themselves. We began hearing rumours of our neighbours attempting to head further south into Florida. Susan suggested the same, but I reminded her of the destruction still left from the hurricane. I was afraid we would be worse off without shelter, so I made the decision to hunker down in our home. I cleared a path to the fireplace that had only been used for decoration and set to the task of getting a fire going. If it was not such a dire situation, my wife would have found amusement in me attempting something like that. I'd never even seen someone use a fireplace, let alone light one. After several attempts, we were able to burn what little wood that was readily available near our home. My family and I huddled around it as if it were going to save us from the fate that waited outside. The whiteness had engulfed our home. The mounds had risen above the windows, breaking some of them. I was forced to reinforce each one to keep the cold out. We sealed every crack or crevice that could possibly let out the heat and tried to remain together. My wife wrapped our children in blankets and pulled them close. The boys did not understand and we were afraid to tell them how serious the situation was. The fear that rested on my wife's face was enough to keep me from ruining what could be our last Christmas. We still attempted to have a big dinner. Despite our ability to effectively cook, I also learned how to cook within a fireplace for the first time. It would have been an interesting experiment if it had not been essential for our survival at the time. We gave up on the idea of turkey or ham, but we had always had a decent stock of canned food. It was a habit I had picked up from my grandparents. I often wondered how they were faring during all of this, but I had my immediate family to worry about. Our world had been plunged into an endless sea of white. I even had nightmares of the stuff that Christmas Eve. My children normally woke me early on Christmas morning, but when my eyes fluttered open, I assumed it was still night. The house was so dark that I could barely see my wife lying next to me. I slowly rose from my bed, still completely clothed, and nudged Susan awake. The house had become far colder than it should have been, and I immediately headed for the fireplace. The fire had gone out at some point, so I ran for the back door, pulling on my boots. My aim was to gather more wood to get the fire going again, but as soon as the door cracked open, I was pelted with a mixture of snow and ice. It stung my face and I cursed at the door while trying to shut it again. Our home had been buried in the vicious powder and I finally understood why no light permeated the windows. My watch read 9 o'clock but it felt much earlier. Susan stumbled into the living room, asking what I was doing. I told her what time it was, and confusion filled her eyes. She went for the window, and was greeted with what I already knew. I do not remember ever seeing her quite so afraid, and the feeling was mutual. I buried my emotions down though, knowing I had to be strong for my family. 
I told her to go check on the kids while I tried to get the fire going again. She disappeared down the hall and I made my way to the dining room. The table and chairs had been passed down through my family for generations, but I knew it would have to be sacrificed. I set to dismantling the wooden chairs first, but was stopped by the sound of my wife's scream. I rushed through the hall, listening to the awful sound echo in my ears. I could feel tears forming in my eyes, but I pushed them back as I rounded the corner. She was grasping the doorframe of our children's room. We had put them together so that Jacob could keep an eye out on Tommy. I could see her body shaking as she stared into the room. Tears rolled over her cheeks as I turned to see inside. The window of their room had given to the weight of our captor, despite my attempt at strengthening it. Snow had buried the boys in the night, and that was when I noticed the flakes of white all over my wife's hands. Susan had attempted to uncover them, and I could see the pale blue skin of their faces huddled together in Jacob's bed. It could have been a sweet scene if it were not for the skin tone, something Susan would have taken a picture of, but this was not that scene. I pulled Susan away as I tried to hold back the sick feeling in my stomach. I felt as though I could release what little Christmas dinner I had in me on the floor at any moment. Soon, her sobs subsided, but when I looked into her eyes, she simply looked numb. I had never seen her this way, and I tried to break her from this trance she seemed to be in, but she said nothing. Her eyes were not even turning my direction when I spoke. Something had broken inside Susan that morning, and I do not blame her. I sat her next to the fireplace and wrapped her in a blanket while I returned to the dining room. The polished wood did not want to burn, but I was determined to give us warmth, so I did not stop until we had a fire. I made it a point to ask Susan to stay by the fire while I returned to the boys' room. I could not leave them that way. But when I reached the door, I found myself pausing just outside. I felt the warm and salty specks across my cheeks before I even saw them. I slowly stepped inside and slid gloves over my hands. I finished clearing away the snow and noticed why they had not simply come to our room. The wood I had used to seal off the window it struck my oldest first. It left a gash near his temple that would have knocked a grown man unconscious. I could only imagine his ten-year-old body had not lasted long after. Tommy had obviously woken after. His tiny form clung to his big brother like a teddy bear. I internally cursed myself for not putting them to bed with us that night but I knew it was too late for that kind of thinking. I removed their bodies and wrapped them in blankets before placing them in the guest room. I took one final look at their bedroom, a place that had held so much joy previously. I imagined the two of them playing and sometimes bickering. My lips tried to curl upwards, but they could not. My eyes drooped to the floor as I turned away and shut the door. I have not returned to that room since, and I doubt I will. I just returned to the living room in hopes of comforting Susan. But when I got there, the blanket was all that remained by the fire. A quick search of the house revealed that the back door had been opened and a tunnel had formed in the frigid wall on the other side, leaving the floor inside 
covered in snow. I tried to follow Susan's footsteps, but eventually they disappeared behind a solid wall of that cursed white. I could only imagine her frantically digging through it and the sound of what was above coming down on her body. I tried to dig into it in search of her body, but the layer that remained was frozen solid. It was like digging my hands into cement, and I knew that Susan could not have survived it, even if my mind did not want to believe it at the time. I found myself picking at it with tools anyway, feeling as though I had nothing left to do. I do not know how much I cried while working at that pointless task, but I do know it started to freeze to my cheeks. I did not stop until my arms could not lift again, and that is when I sat among the snow and stared at what my world had become. I lost track of how long I sat there, or when I decided to come back to the fire. I do remember when I started burning the Christmas gifts and how hard a choice that had been. I opened each one slowly and savoured the idea of the children playing with it for the first time. I could even see Susan standing over them with a camera in hand. She would be giving her biggest smile and snapping away to save each memory. She loved taking pictures, but what I had to do did not need to be captured on any sort of film. I started to feel the numbness that night, that same numbness that overtook Susan earlier that day. It was as cold as the snow that surrounded me, and all I could think was this had been my fault. I should have escaped with my family when I still had the chance. I do not know if it was pride, ignorance, or both, but the guilt was too much. It consumed me and took away everything this holiday was supposed to be about. I started writing this in hopes that someone reads it. I do not know what has happened to the rest of the world, only what has happened to me. I do not know how long I can survive here. My food is running low, and I have run out of things to burn. I cannot even say for certain how long I have been here since my watch has stopped turning, and I still cannot see the sun. I think I will try to dig myself out tomorrow, and if you do find this, no, I did not simply give up. I just wish I had done this sooner. I am so sorry, Susan, Jacob and Tommy. You deserved better than this. I hope you can forgive me. Sincerely, Paul Richardson When buying gifts, I often go to antique shops first. I'm in the mindset that if I ask someone what they want and buy it, that's not a gift, that's just buying something for someone. I also struggle to find ideas from modern technology, as everyone has their own preferences and desires. However, in antique stores, you can find some gems in the rough, and I guarantee that that gift would be unique. This is something I strive for. I love seeing the reaction when giving a gift that they themselves had never thought they wanted. It was because of this that I found myself once again browsing the dusty shelves of a store I found on the way to my son, Jason's house. He had moved out a year ago and had been looking to start a family soon. So my goal was simple, find a nice gift for Christmas. Jason was a classic lover of vintage aesthetic, 
something he probably picked up from me, and was a style getting pretty popular in this day and age. I made some laps around the store, until I found something that made light bulbs flash atop my head. A small antique sewing machine. These are used a lot for decoration, rather than use. Sometimes they're used in high-end store displays for older style clothes. What didn't appeal to me, however, was the decrepit elf doll that sat right next to it. I gently pushed it over and picked up a hefty contraption, the robust metals of the machine weighing it down significantly. The store clerk noticed me struggling in my age and waddled over to help, something I often neglected to ask for, but heartily welcomed when offered. I had it boxed, checked out, and took it over to my car. Happy, I carried on my way to Jason's house. When I pulled up to Jason's driveway, I sneakily rummaged around the car for the wrapping paper and tape I packed earlier. I peeked inside to make sure the ride hadn't disturbed its aged slumber, and my heart dropped. To me, there must have been a mistake. Sat atop the sewing machine, in the spare space left in the box, was the worn out elf doll from before. Staring at me with cracked porcelain skin and detailed glass eyes. I sighed, feeling the clerk must have thought I was after them both at the store due to their close proximity. However, all hope wasn't lost. I knew I needed to head the same way back which would give me a chance to return it after the weekend. So, I suppressed the guilt, as long as I kept in mind to remember to return it. The weekend went great. Though it had only been a year since Jason moved out of town, we conversed like no time had passed. He loved the gift, and emphasised that he looked forward to getting something like that every visit. A joke in one breath, but something I secretly wanted to try keep up in the other. Sadly, the time came to leave, and I slowly trudged my way to the car, trying to make the moments last. When I settled down in the driver's seat, my heart jumped as I saw the elf doll sitting in the passenger side, staring at me. Through my joy, I had completely forgotten about that thing's existence something I chastised myself for, feeling guilty I almost forgot to return it otherwise. Though I must have forgotten that I moved it too, as I only recalled seeing it when working on the gift wrapping in the back seat. I set a destination on my GPS to swing by the antique store and made my way home. Luckily for me, the same store clerk from the few days prior was working when I arrived. He was daintily sitting at his post, not paying much mind to things. It took me a few attempts to get his attention, which he lapped up when he saw that he was going to be useful. Bless him. I pointed at my handwritten receipt of the sewing machine bought days before, which I could immediately see he was worried there was a problem with. I hastily emphasised that the sewing machine was fine and that I had a different problem to what he may have thought. He perked up at this. There's nothing a passionate store clerk loves more than a nice, fun mystery. I pulled out the doll from my bag and let him hold it. He held it up to his face, inspecting the torn green outfit and the faded cracked skin of the decrepit elf doll. I told him how it was against the item I bought and that it was boxed by mistake. I felt a little bad that the mystery that excited him was that simple, but was ready to call it quits there. He furrowed his brow, some reason not immediately reacting with joy at my helpful amendment. Instead, he just lifted his head and meekly told me it wasn't his. This transferred the dumbfounded look onto my face. 
running the events back in my head to see if I had made a mistake. This led to us just going back and forth, telling each other our side of things. I explained how I found it, and how it was next to the item bought, leading me to think he boxed it by mistake. On the other hand, he only rebuttaled with the fact that they never had any such item in their store. I offered to let him keep it, but he said, even free, it was in too bad of a condition to sell, and insisted that I take it home. Defeated, I waddled back to my car, not knowing what to do. Knowing it was bizarrely my possession, I now had less care as I slung it to the driver's seat and made my way home. When I was finally settled back in my comfortable living room, I took the time to study the strange object I now owned. It looked like it was a beautiful doll. Once, its eyes had lost the life it had when first created, now just a dull husk devoid of colour. The skin was cracked in many places, neglect worn on it through unhealing scars. Its hair lay clumped, some unknown substance, once used to keep it styled, now just matted and distressed it further. Its outfit resembled a classic helper of Santa, but the age took away the magic it attempted to convey. To me, I wouldn't have given this doll to anyone if given the choice, so I made the fair decision to throw it away. I lived peacefully with that decision, until that peace was broken. Only a number of days later, I was doing my daily errands, cleaning my most used spots in the house, making sure to check the nook and crannies for collected dust balls. I reached my hand deep behind my sofa to give it a quick wipe, and my heart jumped up to my throat. My hand brushed something alien to my home. After catching my breath, I slowly reached down and pinched the disgusting feeling with my fingertips. Slowly, I pulled it up, only to be met with the dead eyes that were becoming all too familiar to me. It was drenched, carrying the terrible weather from outside with it. As much as I tried to explain this away, how I possibly disgruntled a neighbour who thought I was fly-tipping, or that an animal dragged it back in, smelling my home on it, nothing truly wrote away my fears. I want to say that was a one-off. Sadly, it happened not once, but three separate times. Each time I dragged it further away, and each time it returned in heart-jumping spots, carrying remnants of its journey with it. I shamefully threw it in the river on my last attempt. I even tied a few metal weights to its body. I felt guilty about the idea of littering in nature, but it was an ideal, permanent end, making sure if someone was trying to distress me with it, they couldn't get it back without an excessive amount of effort. I no longer jumped at the sight of the doll. I now felt sorrow at this strange, accursed item. Sitting in the middle of my bathtub, large glasses in the fiberglass of the tub in line with the weight it looked like it dragged. A mystery I was terrified to solve. I decided to give it one final grave a fitting end, one we respectfully give to loved ones. I put the roughed up doll into a fine antique box I decided was fitting. I bagged a fold away shovel and headed to a quiet space in the local park. I felt that if some sort of paranormal entity was involved, it wanted a fitting end. My mind plays stories in my head about a girl's spirit that struggled to move on 
or a grieving mother's spirit mourning the loss of a child. I respectfully gave it a nice ceremony in the park, replicating the ceremonies I'd loved of my dear friend's passings. My final vigil was a lit candle which swayed and danced as I walked away, feeling a mild sense of peace during my exit. I was ready to go home and enjoy anything on TV that didn't relate to horror. No matter how complacent you get, you can always be startled. Maybe it was the unwarranted expectation of the transpired event, but my old heart didn't appreciate the beating it received when I saw my carpet clawed up with small, dirty marks. The scramblings, reminiscent to a startled cat soaked in mud, led around the house, settling in my favourite armchair. There it sat, very much carrying the wear of dirt and haste, but still in one piece. My empathy had ran dry, and all that remained was a strong, burning desire to be rid of this accursed doll once and for all. I dragged it out to the yard and swung open the neglected grill I had sitting in the yard. I poured all the chemicals I could find in the shed, which boasted about the dangers of how flammable they were. Once the cocktail was mixed, I flicked a match onto it and almost took my eyebrows off. I walked away, a sense of finality in my heart. That night, I tried my best to sleep easy. I tried my hardest to squeeze my eyes and blank out the night until morning. But no matter how hard I tried, sleep wouldn't come. All because of the charred, black, melted eyes staring at me from the other side of the bed. Life got significantly harder after that. Each night I was tormented by the presence of the doll, always finding new ways to surprise me. But that was overshadowed by the events that happened throughout each day. Each time I'd come home, I'd return to the smell of something burning. Plastic, paper, food. I'd rush around my house trying to find the source, and when I did, I'd stamp out the small patch of flames immediately. Without fail, I'd look close by and see the doll sat somewhere, staring in the direction of the fire, holding a lighter matches. I stopped stocking anything that could start a fire in my house, yet this didn't reprieve these events. I'd still find a small fire in my house, accompanied by the doll holding a fire starter kit, only these times I didn't recognize them. I was riddled with a sense of anxiety. I would dread going home to start the cycle all over again. Yet I feared worse the idea of not coming home in time. This dichotomy tore me apart inside, taking years off my life. When I didn't leave the house, the fires would still happen, often catching me off guard, either mid-nap or in the middle of an errand. My house is slowly getting ruined each day, and there's nothing I can do to stop it. I'm scared that one day I won't make it home in time, or worse, I won't make it out. When I was younger, I grew up in a small town near a wooded area. My family wasn't big, but it was loving. I had my mom and dad, 
that lived in the town for a number of years before my birth. And after me was my little sister, Leslie. She was a mischievous child when we were kids. She would disappear for long periods of time to go goodness knows where. I was supposed to be looking after her, but it was damn near impossible to keep track of her as soon as my parents left. I never got in trouble though, because nearly on the dot, she'd be back in the house, looking out of breath, clutching the hand of her favourite doll. This doll always looked weird to me. A lot of people have an irrational fear of dolls, but this one always gave me a reason to feel unnerved. However, I could never place why. Something about it just looked off. When my parents asked us what we did, she'd always chime in first and regale wonderful tales of things that never happened. How we sat in my room and played video games, how I was great and looked after her all night, how we had so much fun, we never left each other's company. All of these were obviously lies. Lies hard to point out, as my parents always found it easier to believe I was being modest than my sister mysteriously disappearing for an oddly long period of time. It frustrated me, the feeling of knowing full well I was right, however, never getting a sense of belief. Leslie would always just smile at me and go back to her room. I could never read that smile. Sometimes I look back and wonder if it was a veiled threat for me to keep up the lie for her own nefarious deeds, or maybe she believed she was somewhat doing me a favour for making me out to be a golden star. Something I was always rewarded for, despite my protests. To me, it didn't matter. A mix of fear for her safety and pure childlike curiosity I wanted to know the truth, so I set about the task of making sure I could follow Leslie on her next little adventure. It was sometimes random when both my parents would be gone at the same time and would leave me in charge of my sister, but a constant event was an evening service with a local church. They often had regular meetings with parents and would fill their ears with strange fear-mongering it never made sense to me at the time. Gossiping tales about phantasmal things out to get the kids. Signs to look out for that your child is worshipping Satan. Those sort of things. Just before they left, I made sure to sneak away Leslie's favourite doll. I was never fully sure, but something about how she always had it with her when she returned made me think it was an important part of her travels my mind drumming up scenes of her doing little girly tea party role plays in the middle of the woods. Very Alice in Wonderland. The time came for her to disappear once again, when instead, I saw her frantically running around the house. She had mild panic on her face, something which made sense to me. If I'd lost my favourite toy, I'd have been distraught too. It didn't take long for me to cave in and wordlessly point her in the right direction, mumbling some excuse as to why I knew. Upon finding the doll, she lit up and went on her way. But because I was there when she left, I then had the chance to tail her at a distance. I started far at first, just about seeing which directions she moved. I'd almost lost her a number of times. When I saw she was never checking for anyone trailing her, I made my way closer and closer. Each yard I shortened with less care as I realised how easy this was going to be. The closer I got, the more I saw her demeanour. She was moving with purpose, like she knew every step of the way to her destination, as if it were her daily commute to school. The directions got hazy as we edged into the nearby forest, 
and soon cut deep into the thick of a section that was unfamiliar to me. We slinked around some large trees, oaks that looked older than the trees in the usual hangout spots and trails. Soon she started to slow, as if approaching something important. So I followed suit and made sure not to draw any attention with breaking twigs or the rustling of leaves. The noise I never expected to hear, however, were the sounds of voices. A mild childish social anxiety kicked in and I stayed in the shadows, scared I was intruding. A remnant from the don't interrupt others parenting that was drilled into me at a younger age. Leslie sounded cheery, like she was greeting a lifelong friend. She called out many names each responding with a strange voice unlike anyone I recalled from school. They sounded raspy, yet not adult. A strange combination compared to the usually clean and high-pitched voices most kids her and my age had. If I had to compare it to the most familiar thing I could, it was like when a kid did a horrible impression of their decrepit grandmother. Each voice rasped back to her in cheer, each greeting her by name too. The formality ran my mind back to my suspicion that she was doing little girly tea parties. However, it didn't line up to my idea that she was doing it alone. Curiosity ran through me, and before I thought about my actions, I had already stepped around and dawdled out my thoughts. What I saw briefly took my breath away, freezing me in place. Around Leslie, riddled around the branches, were a wide variety of discarded looking dolls. Each one was different and had strange features that made them look a little off. At my entrance, all the heads turned in unison. It was surreal seeing all their heads turn without the bodies reacting. Leslie, what's going on? I muttered with a perplexed tone. No, she yelled back, which shut me right up. Before I could get out any response, figuring out why she replied like that, the doll spoke up. You told someone. You told our secret. This was not something for you to share. You promised. One of the dolls bellowed. The severity of the situation didn't hit me, but Leslie broke down in fear. She begged and pleaded with the dolls. She said in every way she could vocabularize that this was a misunderstanding and that she never told a soul. Sadly, these words fell on deaf, plastic ears. Wordlessly, the pitter-patter of plastic clicking on wood and dirt resounded. Very quickly, they were upon her. Fight or flight kicked in, and my body immediately fell on flight. My reaction was to get an adult. The idea of Leslie wandering into the woods alone was beyond me. What was happening before me had me entirely bewildered. I heard sharp taps behind me as I sprinted, the sound of short legs trying their hardest to keep up, but failing. Though the noise was chilling, it was miles more bearable than the frantic, panicked screams that echoed from further behind. I got home, and remembering my parents weren't in, I pulled up the phone they left for emergencies and quickly dialed my parents. Frantically, I stuttered out all I could. I didn't need to say much, my tone telling volumes more than my words. They hastily arrived home, and I pulled at them to follow me into the woods. It took me a while to track back to where I'd remembered going, the darkness settling in, creating both confusion and a sense of dread. When we finally made the last turn to the clearing where the dolls were, 
no plastic could be seen. The area was devoid of any hint of a doll. What did remain was my sister, torn up and discarded in shreds. We didn't linger. My parents immediately suspected it was a pack of wild animals and frantically dialed any emergency service they could. But to me, I saw something different. To me, they were the markings of the sharp ends of tiny dull fingers. My great aunt died on June 6th, 2018. At least, that's what the letter said. I received the letter and the attached package on December 25th. I thought it was something I had ordered from Amazon and forgotten. But then I remembered that the mail wasn't delivered on Christmas. I shrugged it off, opening the enclosed letter. As I began to read, my stomach sank in disbelief. Dear Mr. Edison, This item has been left to you by Abilene Edison, your great aunt, who was pronounced deceased on June 6, 2018. We apologize for the delay in delivering this to you. Being her only living relative, we determined that her wish for you to have this item is legal and beyond our control. The rest of her belongings have been incinerated. Her body is unavailable at this time. Please do not contact our office as we have officially severed ties with the Edison Family Trust. If you have any questions, you'll have to find the answers on your own. Goodbye, Golson, Orez and Dan Horn Law Firm. First of all, I did not know I had a great aunt. My parents died in a car crash when I was in college, and I had no grandparents or aunts or uncles, so I just figured I was the only Edison left. My parents never mentioned a great aunt Abilene. We were a close but secretive family. We didn't let a lot of people in. I wondered what Abilene had done to be erased from our history. The package itself was square, wrapped in a dull brown paper. My address was handwritten, unlike the letter. The text was a deep red. I took the paper off, slowly, careful to preserve everything. My mother was meticulous in all things. She taught me to enjoy the dull, mundane activities of life. Slipping my finger beneath the paper was ritualistic. I took my time as my gift revealed itself. My only Christmas present, I thought wistfully. Under the paper was an ornate carved wooden box. I let my fingers linger on the spirals, leaves and serpents. There was no discernible pattern, but it was beautiful. The box itself wasn't smooth or polished. The rough wood gave way only where a knife had been held to its face. Needless to say, it was an odd gift. Why would a woman I had never met sent me this? I opened the lid, expecting an empty vessel. Instead, I found a tree ornament. It was an angel with a cross behind it. The angel had brilliant, pale skin. She was swathed in a purple robe with feathery golden wings. The cross behind her had a similar gold glint. The ornament seemed to be made of clay and was cold to the touch. I had no idea why Abilene would save this one thing and send it to me. 
Maybe it held some sentimental value. Our family wasn't religious at all, and although we had a tree growing up, now that I was a lonely twenty-something, I'd never bothered with it. No family to share Christmas with anyway. I was tempted to put the ornament back in the box and donate it somewhere, but I felt a pull towards it. I felt like it belonged with me. I took down a small picture from the wall of the living room and hung the ornament on the nail. It looked incredibly awkward against the drywall. Such a beautiful ornament deserved a lush tree to rest upon. I got an unexplainable shiver and tried to ignore it, but I couldn't take my eyes off the angel. Suddenly, my skin felt too small for my body. I squirmed inside my clothes, my muscles pushed against their organs, wrapping, making my arms shoot out in front of me. I was speechless, bewildered by my own body's betrayal. A knot in my chest started pounding, my autonomous arms flopped around until it reached a pen on the nearby table. My finger cracked one by one as they moved on their own, brutishly grasping at the pen. I let out a small gasp, horrified as I felt other parts of my body strain and move on their own. My legs shakily carried me towards the wall where the ornament hung. My neck rolled my head around like a bowling ball on a slinky. The pen was thrust onto the wall by my clumsy hand, dragging the tip up and down. I closed my eyes. This wasn't happening. It couldn't be happening. Suddenly, my body was let go, and I fell to the ground with a sickening thud. I was motionless for a moment. There was a terrible fear that I wouldn't be able to move my body on my own anymore, but I was able to slowly sit up, rubbing my head, which had hit the floor quite hard. I looked up at the wall, and my breath stopped short. I, well, my hand, had drawn a crude tree shape beneath the ornament. It was jagged and uneven but definitely resembled a Christmas tree. Why had my body been so keen on drawing it? I stood, shakily. I was exhausted. I took some deep breaths, trying to regain normalcy. To test my body out, I stretched up and down, bent my fingers back, squeezed my toes, I was happy to find that everything worked exactly as it was supposed to. A serene feeling washed over me, and I was happy to presume that the past ten minutes had been an oddity, not anything to worry about. But then, my head began to pound. It was not a normal headache. It felt like my brain was swelling too big for my skull. This time, I screamed, unable to hold in my horror. With my palms and my temples, I fell to my knees, looking up at the angel. For some reason, it felt like she was smirking at me. Something inside my head bulged against my fingers. I lost track of my breath as blood began to pool inside my ears. Something was digging its way out of my skull. Barbs pricked my hands, and so I dropped them, hanging my head with the severity of the pain. My skin cracked and broke. Blood was now clouding my vision and dropping to the floor like rain. I tried to stay awake, keep it together. It took the crown of thorns over 20 minutes to fully emerge from beneath my skin. I felt every single second of that devilish time span. My head was bleeding and ripped apart, but I remained conscious. I stopped screaming. I was now in a deep sob. 
Hesitantly, I touched the crown, feeling the tips of the thorns and the bits of flesh stuck there. What an image I must have made. Bowed before a penned tree on a wall, knelt in worship. Above me, an ornament with a laughing angel. At first, I thought the laughter was in my head. But as I raised my eyes to the ornament, I could see the angel's mouth was now open. Shrieks of glee coming from inside. I stood, careful not to slip on the blood, and grabbed the clay thing. It did not stop laughing. I threw it back in the box, angrily closing the accursed lid. Screw this Christmas present, I thought furiously. You're the one who's screwed, the box replied. Trembling, I opened the lid again. The angel now had her hands on her hips. Hang me back up, kid. I gulped for her hair as I quickly put the ornament back on the wall. She looked around, her tiny clay head swiveling freely, as if she were alive. Nice house. This will do perfectly. I stared, unable to be surprised since I'd grown thorns from my head. I was weak, covered in blood, and completely confused. The ornament sighed. You look like crap, kid. I, well, I... Nah, don't talk. Just listen. This is my house now. You got that? And you're mine too. We get a whole year together until next Christmas. Who are you? My mouth was dry. The pain had dulled. You can call me Lucy. Now, go take a shower. We're going out tonight. We? Suddenly, my right arm moved on its own, grasping my throat. I gasped, using my other hand to try pry the other off me. I fought for a few seconds before my right arm went limp again. I heaved. The ornament giggled. I'm with you now, kid. Can't get rid of me. If you try, I'll kill you. If you say anything to anyone, I'll kill you. Or just let them lock you in a loony bin. She chuckled. You're young. I like that. Last one was too old. Died before the year was even up. Dusty cow. You mean my great aunt? She wasn't your great aunt, kid. I go where I want. What? What? What am I? She grinned. I'll give you one hint. Slowly, excruciatingly so, the cross behind her began to move. It twisted behind her until... It was completely upside down. Much better. But... You're an angel. My voice was whiny. Almost childlike. I was realising that I was not myself anymore. I belonged to someone new. The ornament bounced from the volume of her laughter. <laughs> so is Satan. You don't hold it against him, do you? I collapsed to the floor, crying. My left hand raised by itself and slapped me. I felt my throat begin to move, something mixing with my tongue. And then I said, without my permission, Merry Christmas, kid. My school had a yearly tradition around Christmas. 
the teachers would rally all the students of our small town school to write a letter to Santa. The teachers all collaborated and emphasized to us that they knew Santa's real address and what we wrote would be sent to him. I don't know whether my parents never religiously drilled the idea of Santa into me, or if I was a weird kid, but throughout my childhood, I never believed he was real. So I always felt this idea of entertaining this letter scheme was below me. To me, this was just a silly way for teachers to get kids excited for the holiday. In school, I was one of the rough kids. I got in fights a lot, and the majority of the other students would avoid me. Even teachers had an apprehension of being around me. Scared my temperament was not limited to just kids. Hindsight helps me say this, but at the time, I thought it was everyone else who were weird. I attribute all this to my uncle and what he did. He was a brute. When my parents weren't around, which was a lot, he was the one to look after me. During those many nights, he would be rough with me, making me try beer, telling me about illicit things I was woefully ill-prepared to know, all for the delusion that he was making me tough, when in reality, it made me closed off only able to express my emotions through violence and hate. Each year, I never participated writing the letters. When I did, I'd often just scribble insults or crude doodles. But every so often, I'd notice something. A handful of kids would come back after Christmas break, raving, that Santa had brought them what they asked for. They would talk about how Santa left them a letter saying they were especially good that year and brought their wildest dreams to life. Kids from poor families got the latest game consoles. Lonely children got the pet of their dreams. One kid even claimed his mother's illness was taken away by Santa. In my pessimistic attitude, I just drummed it up to the excuse that the teachers gave the letters to their parents. Another reason I never took part in writing a letter, scared my uncle would catch wind and judge me for what I secretly desired. The pattern though was undeniable. Kids were getting what they wanted, and in some way, if it worked for me, the letter sent to my parents was an interesting way to slyly let on what my uncle was doing, to tip off my parents at what was going on behind their backs, or to avoid a lesson drilled into me by my uncle that snitches get stitches, literally. A mantra which kept me quiet for far too long. One year, I grabbed a pen and ham-fisted a simple letter I apprehensively wrote that I never wanted to see my uncle again, that I wished Santa would take him away. I finished the note off, also asking for a puppy. I was a kid who didn't want a puppy at that age, something my parents never knew, since wanting a pet was girly, according to my uncle. When some of the more outspoken kids confronted me at the idea of participating in such an event I was so vocal against, I simply told them I wrote the nastiest letter to the head teacher. I told wild details, which had the kids roiling in laughter, in a way adding to my persona, a metaphor for the facade I had built up. Christmas came around. Everything happened as they did every year. A dysfunctional family dinner and the awkwardly quiet opening of thoughtless gifts. Despite the ritual not changing, I was broken. I berated myself for hoping the little hope I had left 
only for it to be wasted. From then on, my life was turbulent. I had basically lost all my hope, and for many years after, I lost friends, ruined relationships, and threw away opportunities, all because of my attitude. Inside, I never felt like a bad person, but it was how I expressed myself. And then, something amazing happened. Someone saw that. My first long-lasting relationship was with someone that understood how I felt inside. She was very patient. She had to be. She stood by me through many rough years. Something I commend her for. Though I didn't see it at the time, my life with her were the best years I could ask for. Sadly, it didn't last forever. Time grinded away at the relationship, my unmoving attitude keeping me still as a rock as she pushed forward in life. Eventually, the distance was too much and she had no choice but to leave. It was her leaving that finally shook me enough. A wake-up call. I hated how I became a slave to myself, always saying I wanted to change, but never truly lifting myself from my spot and taking the necessary steps forward. Admittedly, I started seeking professional help in hopes of winning my girlfriend back, but after starting, I couldn't stop. And soon, I was doing it for myself and no one else. This is not to say it wasn't easy. Family gatherings brought everything back. I had a reputation, and I was terrified to break it. But privately, I was starting to edge out of my shell. I started with therapy sessions. Opening up about everything after keeping it inside for too long released so much tension. I found myself shedding tears. Something unheard of about me, if you knew who I was. Switching personalities is hard when surrounded by people who know you as a certain way. So I took to some online apps to meet new people who didn't know me. A fresh start. To contrast my life, I chose events and activities that I made fun of throughout my early years. I met up to play video games instead of drinking beer that I secretly hated in rough bars. I spent time learning the game Magic the Gathering rather than poker nights that always ended with a little scuffle. Hell, I even tried D&D. To my surprise, I started feeling something I hadn't felt for as long as I could remember. The warm feeling of joy. I had missed that my whole life. I always knew it was in me, and I was saddened somewhat by how long it took to come out. But that was overshadowed by the bellowing feelings I now had. I used this energy. I took to amending things with people I hurt. Through social media like Facebook and Twitter, I hunted down the people I wronged throughout my school life and after. Some moved far away, so I could only message them. Often, they initially thought I was messing with them, in complete disbelief that I even contemplated showing a softer side. Some, unfortunately, didn't accept my apology something I understood, and settled on the notion that I tried. I became a new person. That is the year when my uncle went missing. It was out of nowhere, around midwinter. He was healthy, active, and up to his usual shenanigans. So it was a shock when I received the call 
that he never came back from one of his nights out. Searches were made, posters were hung, and notices were sent. However, no trace was ever found. It was like he disappeared into thin air. Christmas was not long after, and things were initially quiet. An empty seat weighing heavy on the family's minds. I could see the family was not enthused, so I did something unexpected. I took the initiative. I started reading the jokes from the Christmas crackers we pulled before our meal. At first, my family was shocked, but soon joined in. I heard something I hadn't heard from my family for a long time. Genuine laughter. We played festive games afterwards, despite being full to the brim with Christmas dinner. I made a fool of myself, and I thank my parents for not making a big deal out of it. I was a changed man. In the end of the night, we opened our presents. Most gifts were thoughtless as usual, remnants of how Christmas used to be. However, my gifts lit up the room. Each one carried a level of thoughtfulness they'd never seen before. Feelings I kept inside for so long materialized and displayed for all to see. Something they all picked up on and vowed to top the next year. The last gift was an odd looking box with my name on it, topped with a small envelope. Some thought it was from my uncle before he disappeared, though I doubted it as he never really got me anything before. I started with the card, written in the cleanest cursive I'd ever seen. It was addressed directly to me. The message was brief, with talk of how good I was that year, and wishes that I got everything I'd asked for. I started to think it was from one of my childhood classmates that I'd reconnected with. My heart jumped to my throat when I heard a noise bounce around inside. Despite years of cultivating a hardened composure, the sounds I heard froze me for a moment. Panicked, I ripped open the package and looked down. There's two adorable, bright eyes stared back at me and barked.